Hi, guys. I don't think I've ever spoken in such a small group before, so it's good. It's actually nice and intimate. So how are you all this morning? Okay, awesome. Quick show of hands. Who's actually renovated a house before? Okay, quite a few of you. Wow. How did you enjoy it? Did you enjoy it? Well, you're not sure. Maybe. Okay, we're going to talk about that today. Who hasn't renovated a house before? Just, okay, a couple. All right, fantastic. All right. Let's talk about renovating. So today, I'm going to be perfectly frank with you. I'm going to basically tell you some of the ups and downs of renovating, but mostly the fantastic things about renovating, okay? Now, where did it all start for me? Basically, I became a professional renovator 11 years ago. 11 years ago, I was actually working at L'Oreal as a marketing manager, and pretty much my situation was is that I was starting at 7 o'clock in the morning and literally working till about 11 o'clock Uh, Monday to Friday, I was actually taking work home on the weekends. So it was fair to say that I was pretty much a slave to my job. Now, back then, I was earning fantastic money. I was 30 back then. I'm 41 now. And pretty much, I was earning $160,000 a year. So you'd probably say that's pretty good money for a 30-year-old. Would you agree? Okay. So I was working quite hard, like literally had no life. I was earning fantastic money. So what I looked to do was actually to go out and buy an investment property, okay, because I was earning fantastic money. As it turned out, I actually happened to buy this little property here. Now, the great thing is these properties are all within a five-kilometer radius of where we're standing right now. So certainly take down some of these addresses and drive past them if you like. Now, I went out. I started doing my due diligence in my target suburb. I basically concentrate on Balmain, Roselle, Lilyfield. They're my three targets suburbs and I'll talk about that a little bit later and I came across this property now I didn't consciously go out looking to buy an unrenovated property in fact I was actually going at going to buy a, a passive property investment something that I could rent out as it turned out I came across this property here now this property was quite a good property it was a rather large property and it was just tired Do you know what I mean by that it was just cosmetically had great bones but it was just tired, it needed a facelift. Now, I didn't know anything about renovating at this stage, okay? It was very, very green. However, I went into this property thinking, it looks good, it has some potential, I feel I could make some money from this. So I never consciously set out to become a professional renovator. I fell into it by accident. You know, do you agree with me? Sometimes your life takes a different direction and you can just end up doing something entirely different. Well, that's what happened for me 11 years ago. So I ended up getting into this property. I ended up buying it at auction. I went to auction the following week. I went and bought that property. Now, that property I paid 537000 for. This was 11 years ago, okay? Now, in terms of the actual scope of the project, what it was it was a cosmetic renovation okay so it was purely just doing aesthetic changes to the property there was no structural element to that now my renovation budget I had no idea what I was doing I made lots of mistakes on this as most people do when they first embark on a renovation project I allowed in my budget a feasibility sorry I allowed a budget of a hundred thousand dollars to complete the works to this property now where did I get that figure of a hundred thousand dollars from any idea I might as well have got it out of a cornflakes packet. That's the reality. I just plucked it out of the air. I thought, okay, 100,000 sounds like a nice round figure. That should do it. Because unfortunately, this is what a lot of people do. They have no idea what things are really going to cost them before they embark on a renovation project. They go through the process and they work out that, hey, at the end of it, I came in 50% over budget, whatever it may be. So that was exactly what happened to me. The the project cost ended up coming in at 150,000. Now, when you see the little wallet there, that is everything. It's the holding cost. I'm going to show you some examples today. So when you see that little wallet, that is the total cost of the project. The the stamp duty, the acquisition, the renovation cost, the holding cost, the resale cost, you name it, it is everything with the exception of capital gains tax. Okay, So these are pre-tax figures just from a capital gains tax perspective. Because let's face it, there are some people who pay 48 cents in the dollar and there's other people like myself that pay very minimal capital gains tax by having my business business structured entirely different, okay? So, 150000 Now, the way that I managed this, I was still working my job at L'Oreal, okay? And how I managed, was, managed this particular project, still working my full-time job, it was I was calling just tradies during the day, and I was going to a site of an evening to check on the progress of work, just making sure that tradies were doing what they were supposed to be doing. And that had a few, had a few ups and downs along the way. It wasn't all smooth saving, save, um, sailing. And so... 
the project from start to finish was about five months. So from the time I actually signed the contract, sorry, I settled on the property, to the time that the money was back in my bank account was five months from start to finish, okay? Now, I took that property to auction, so I got in, did the cosmetic reno, so I wasn't working on site you know, between Monday to Friday, I was simply just going there at the end of the night, looking around the property, making sure work was progressing. And then I was physically working on site of a Saturday morning. Now, I made, as I said, I made every conceivable mistake. You know, back then, I was doing a lot of the work myself on a Saturday morning. So needless to say, on that very first project, I was there chipping the old lime and the old cement off the walls and putting it into hessian sacks and dragging them out to the mini skip, absolutely killing myself. And it wasn't until I got into project number three, four, five that I, it, it dawned on me one day, hey, I shouldn't actually be doing the work myself. That's not the smartest way to work. So I learned, basically, as I evolved through my projects, I learned things, and when I made those changes, my property projects became much more profitable and just better all round. So I took that property to auction. Guess how much I sold it for? Any idea? Four months after I, after I bought it? Oh, I wish. <laughs> I would be an absolute legend if I did that. <laughs> I sold it for 955000 okay? So on my very first project, I made a profit margin of 268000 over a quarter of a million dollars profit margin on a cosmetic renovation. The actual renovation itself took two and a half months, two, two and a half months from start to finish. So for me, it was like I'd won the second prize, like second division of the lotto, and I went, wow, that's like, you know, to make that money in such a short period of time. And I actually enjoyed the process as well. Even though I had some ups and downs along the way, overall, looking back, I enjoyed the process. So what do you think then I did? Yeah, I quit my job. I thought, okay, this is, a, this is a great way to make money. So I threw in my job, and that was, you know, that was a tough call, leaving that security of, you know, the $160,000 job. Um, that was a tough call, but I made that decision. And looking back, it was the best decision I ever made. So what renovating does for me is many things. Um, first of all, it, largely it reduced my work hours. So instead of working 14, 15 hour days, literally having no life, I pulled it back from working 7 till 3 p.m. So even to this day right now, I still, I'm still on site from 7 a.m. to 3 p.m. in the afternoon, Monday to Friday. I don't work weekends on my renovation site. That's my rule. A lot of tradies will want to work on the weekends. But what you say is you say no, no work on the weekends because you also have to have a life balance with renovating as well. If you don't manage this, then renovating can consume your life, okay? So when you force work to happen during the week and the week only, what you'll find is that most people, you get actually, you become more productive because you know you've got a shorter time frame to actually to get get the work done. So that was a big thing for me is that I started to actually get some of my life back by not being a corporate slave. What it also did is it gave me a phenomenal income as well. I was on 160000 you know, great money, but it just gave me so much more in terms of my income capabilities. So I do pretty much two big structural renovations a year. Well, that's what I aim for every single year. I'm averaging three to four hundred thousand dollars net profit margin on a th on a four month structural renovation. So you can see, I only have to do two a year. That's a very good income. Would you agree? So you know, largely for the last couple of years, or before I started public speaking, I was literally working about ten months of the year, and I had on average about two two or three months off a year on holidays. So quite often what I do is I do a very big structural renovation. Yes, I work hard during the structural renovation, but then I also play hard after the structural renovation. And there's lots of creative ways that you can do in terms of, you know, even just charging things to your credit card so that once the renovation is over, you get to fly overseas free on your frequent flyer points that you rack up. So there's lots of ways that you, that you can manage this to really benefit from it. Okay, what I also loved about renovating is that it took me out of like the corporate office, stuffy air conditioned office, and it put me out into the healthy outdoor environment. So I suddenly started getting sun and fresh air. And I actually found that my health and well being actually improved once I actually got out of a corporate office. Is anybody sharing what I'm saying? Yeah? Okay, fantastic. Now, also, personal accomplishment. I love renovating. Like, I love it. I'm truly am blessed to say that I enjoy what I do and it doesn't feel like a job. Anybody, the people that have renovated here before, did it feel like a job for you? 
No? Okay, would you agree it was a fun process? Okay, fantastic. So what I do is, this is what I do with every project that I do. I always walk across the street and I stand back on the, I'll stand on the curb and I'll look back at what I've completed when it's all finished. And for me, that's a level of personal satisfaction that you won't actually understand until you've actually gone through the process and experienced, experienced that yourself. So that's why I love renovating. So needless to say, I drive around my target suburbs and I've got a canvas of my work everywhere I go. Also, what it's given me is given me choices in my life. So because I have become financially free, I can literally do whatever I want or whatever, that ma whatever makes me happy. So it's giving me phenomenal choice. If I want to go to New York next week, I can. I always seem to head off to New York. It's the only place that people can't reach me. So I have to fly to the other end of the universe. But, you know, if I want to go to New York next week, I can because I have that ability. I, I'm financially free to be able to do that. And what it does, it gives me a sense of, I guess, inner calm that I never, ever have to worry about money problems ever again. Would you agree with that, that lack of money causes people a lot of stress? And when you have that, when you have that security, that safety net behind you, you find actually that you become just a lot happy generally because your security is taken care of. Also what it does, it, you know, having money in the bank is one thing, but at the end of the day, we all die, right? There's no point being the richest person in the plot. So what I've found, and I'm not going to harp on about this because I don't want to view this I oh, don't want you to view this as like, like a corporate publicity stunt because it's not. But what I found is that it's given me the ability to actually share my wealth. Now, somebody actually said to me when I was 30, if you've never done any community service or charitable thing by the age, by the age of 30, you're likely to never ever do it. And it actually hit home with me because I hadn't actually done anything. I hadn't given back to the community before. So what renovating has given me the ability to do is now to share that wealth with other people. I have a mandate that I don't donate to the big charities. Um, what I do is I actually look for the individual families in need. So just yesterday morning, $15,000 got deposited into a quadriplegic, um, the father of a quadriplegic. He actually bought a car and I paid for all the modifications for his disabled wheelchair. So I know now that my donations are going, uh, truly hitting the people that need, they're not going to corporate overheads, which unfortunately a lot of big charities, not all charities, but a lot of charities unfortunately spend the money that you donate on corporate overheads. Would you agree with that? Okay, so I feel like I'm contributing. I know now that through renovation, I will go to the grave feeling good about what I've done and you know, knowing that I did some good on this earth. What I also do is I love speaking, and now for me, with my knowledge, you know, I'm obviously helping others you know, create um, change in their lives as well, so I get a big kick from that. All right, so who wants to know what you're going to learn today? You're a pretty quiet bunch, aren't you? <laughs> wiggy, wiggy. Okay, so... What we're going to learn is this. You're stuck with me for the next hour and a half, two hours. So we're going to try and make this fun. We're going to talk about all the reasons today why you should be renovating, okay? Everybody tells you the reasons why you shouldn't. I'm here to tell you the reasons why you should be renovating. We're also going to bust some renovation myths. Now, let's face it, you know, renovating can either go either way. People will either say, yeah, do it, fantastic. Or, you know, renovating, why would you want to renovate? You know, the renovation horror stories pour out. Trade is ripping you off. Trade is not turning up. All sorts of things. Would you agree with that? Okay, so we're going to bust some renovation myths here today. Now, I'm also going to show you some case studies. Now, I've renovated 26 properties over the last um, 10, 11 years, so I've done a lot. Most of my renovations are bigger structural renovations. If I did um, just cosmetics, I probably would have been on to about my 500 um, property by now. But I did start with cosmetic renovations. I did a couple of cosmetic renos and then I quickly trans, um, transitioned into structural renovations fairly early on in my career. So I don't have time today to show you about all of them, so I'll pluck out you know, four or five projects, not the ones with the, that I made the most money on, just ones with an interesting story to tell. I'm also going to share with you the four phases of renovation. Now, I've developed an eight-step system. I developed a system as I went through the course of my projects. Um, I guess with my marketing background, I'm very systems orientated. So obviously, I winged it on my first renovation. I had absolutely no idea what I was doing. Um, and then at each, each property that I acquired thereafter, I started to become smarter about how I managed the whole process. So needless to say, I have developed an eight-step system, which I'll talk to you about a little bit later. And um, 
so there's the eight steps of the renovation process. Now, for the simplicity of today, what I've done is I've condensed that down into four key phases, okay? So I'm going to give you some really good content today that you can take away and actually start to get your head around the concept of renovating. Now, who would like some more cash flow or more equity? All of you, right? Okay, so I'm going to show you two ways to actually get us started renovating with very little to no money. How does that sound? Yeah, okay, because how successful you are with property investment or renovating really also comes down to your mindset and your ability to put a creative hat on as well. And obviously, if you like what you hear today, I'm going to talk to you a little bit more about my workshops. Now, I make it no secret, I run three-day workshops. A ticket to my workshop will cost you 5500 okay? I make no secret of that. However, it will be the best 5500 that you will ever spend, even if you don't want to do renovating, even if you just want to go out and buy a damn good property investment, it'll be the best money that you've ever spent. So we'll talk about that a little bit later. So how does that sound for today? All right, cool. All right, so we're going to look at the reasons why people don't renovate. What are some of them? I'm going to spice you up a bit now because I know it's Saturday morning, it's early. Could have stayed in bed today. What are some of the reasons you think that people don't renovate? No cash. No yeah, that's a very valid one. Lack of knowledge. Time, no time? Fear. Fear. Uh, fear's a big one. Not knowing. What else? Laziness. Laziness. Absolutely. Here are the common reasons why people don't renovate. First of all, lack of money. So people say, I haven't got a deposit on a house. I can't fund the renovation budget. Where am I going to get that money from? If you think like that, you will severely limit your own potential. There's all sorts of things you can do today. Particularly if you're doing a structural renovation, there's things called construction loans. Once you've got your structural reno approved, you can go to the bank. Not all banks, okay, only some banks. So you're going to know which banks do what. Not, ever, not all banks are equal. So you can go to the bank, get a construction loan. There's all sorts of things you can do to basically get a start in property. Now, if you have no money, yes, of course it's going to be a little bit harder. You have to jump through a few extra hoops, but it is not impossible to start in property investment or renovating with absolutely no money. And I'm going to show you a couple of examples of how I've been able to do that. All right, lack of time. People say, I haven't got time. Well, the reality is we're all super busy, aren't we? We can all find some way to consume our time. If you really want to change your financial position, you have to create the time. You have to make the time, okay? So if you want to move forward, that is what's required. Okay, they can't manage it with children, okay? Renovating is not an excuse with children, okay? Reno horror stories. Now, we've heard about all of those, okay? Tradies not turning up, getting stung variations, ripping you off, threatening to kill you, all sorts of things. We go to a dinner party on Saturday night, always seems to turn to renovating horror stories. Would you agree with that? So we're going to talk about those. And, you know, a lot of those renovation horror stories are because of, not because of tradies, um, it's mainly because of the person managing their projects. I'm going to talk to you about that a little bit later. Okay, they don't have the skills. They go, well, I can't project manage. I wouldn't have any idea about construction. So people fear their own ability. Let me tell you, you've got a couple of choices when you're doing renovations. You've got cos cosmetic renos. You've got structural renos. It is very, if, even if you fear you haven't got the skills, start with cosmetic renovations because let me tell you, it is extremely hard to stuff up a cosmetic renovation, okay? Can you ring a painter and say, give me a quote to paint the house? Can you all do that? Okay, so people, what they do is they overcomplicate things. They make it appear harder than what it really is. So you've just got to step back and really look at it for what it is. Okay, trade is difficult. So most people just think, oh, they just think, the tradies are going to be so difficult. They're going to give me so much grief. I just can't be bothered. So people leave opportunity on the table because they can't be bothered taking on challenges potentially that may arise. Not quick enough. Renovating is too slow. I want something that's going to basically put 100 grand or 50 grand in my bank account within a week. Let me tell you, I don't know anything that puts 50 grand in your bank account you know, each week. Um, maybe apart from share trading if you hit it right. But generally, there is no overnight road to wealth. Would you agree with that? People speak about it, it doesn't exist. So yes, 
Effort is required with renovating, okay? I'm making no false illusions here, but if you're willing to put in the effort, then you can definitely have a very comfortable lifestyle and make very good profit margins if you know what you're doing. Okay, last thing people say, I know nothing about construction. I wouldn't have a clue where to start. Do these people here look like builders? Do they? This is one of my very, fairly, um, very early workshops, one of my small workshops that I did when I very first started speaking. These people aren't builders. None of these people know anything about construction. You don't need to know about construction. Do I look like a builder? No. When you think of a builder, it's a bit more like this, right? <laughs> and no, that's not me, all right? I'm about a quarter of that. Okay, the thing is, is that I don't look like a builder. I don't need to be a builder. This is not about having the best construction knowledge. Even today, after being a professional renovator for 11 years, I still do not know everything about construction. I still probably only know 30, 40% about construction. If I got a builder on stage here, they would be able to outwit me any day on the construction knowledge. So I'm not great at construction. I understand the basics now, obviously, doing this for 11 years, but I don't need to be. What I need to be good at is being a good project manager, okay? And that's what professional renovators are. They're simply the delegators, the project managers in their projects where they are out bringing in people, bringing in all the experts like the builders, the painters, tilers, whatever. They are the experts and telling them what needs to be done. Okay, now, hands up in the audience are ladies who are potentially interested in renovating. Okay, quite a few, fantastic. 11 years ago, I was literally the only female on a construction site. Like it or not, the construction industry is still 99.9% .9 male dominated. Would you agree with that? Okay, so 11 years ago, it was a very rare thing to see a woman out on site. In fact, the tradies would come out to site and say, where's your husband, love? Um, after I buried them, that person in the concrete slab, you know, off I'd go. So the point there is that more and more women now are, are basically buying property projects and they're going in and, pro and project managing the sites themselves. Now, there are four key skills that a woman has when it comes to renovating and working on a construction site. Any guess what those skills might be? Yep. Yeah, so communication. Yeah, women are different. And I love it when a man answers. <laughs> yeah. You know what? That is a very good point. So what you'll find is that most tradies coming out to site, when you're a woman on a construction site, because you are female, they automatically assume that you may not know as much as them, and they almost, they almost go into helpful mode straight away. They go, she's a chick, um, you know, I'll help her out rather than trying to rip off. So that's a very good point, actually. Intuition. intuition, yeah. Just good taste and design. Oh, that's right. We have got good taste, haven't we? Okay, anything else? Multi, that was one of the words. I'm looking for four key words, multitasking. So, ladies, can we do like 10 things at once and not blink an eyelid? Absolutely. So on a renovation site, you've really only got to do um, organise your materials to be there and organise your tradies. So we find that a breeze. What else we're great for is that, you know, do we love organising everything? Okay, we're natural organisers. So that therefore makes us great project managers out on site as well. Also, do we spot everything? Just like nothing much gets past us, ladies, does it? So what does that make us great for? Detail. Attention to detail, quality control, okay? So on my sites, I'm very attuned to this because I notice everything. You know, I'm very good at making sure my sites are done at a great quality level just through the quality perspective as well. Also, the last thing, the last skill is that we are naturally caring. Like, I'm not saying this, no disrespect to the fellas, you're fantastic as well, but I'm just trying to point out to my sister friends in the audience that, you know, you think that being by, by being a woman that you are on the back foot and you actually are. So because we're naturally caring, I find that I do things on my renovation sites where tradies absolutely love working with me because I pay attention to the small details. I'm also caring on site. So I'm going to talk to you about that a little bit later. Now, hands up in the audience, who's got children? Okay, so as I said, renovating is not an excuse not to be, renovating is not an excuse because you have children. I am a mother. In fact, this is my little girl, Milan. She's four. She's cute, isn't she? 
She looks like me, right? <laughs> um, every week I say, what do you want to be, Milan? And, you know, she'll say, I want to be a renovator. She can't say the word renovator yet. But then again, I asked her that a couple of days ago and she told me she wants to be a chicken farmer. So, I don't know, it's changing. I don't know what she'll be. <laughs> but um, what I find is that as a mother... Renovating is the perfect occupation. It's not like, for example, if I was sitting in an office or I worked an office job, I have to be at my desk by 8.30 or 9 o'clock, basically making sure I'm there on that deadline, otherwise I'm going to have a boss looking over my shoulder saying, where's Cherie? It's 9 o'clock, where is she? Okay. So what I find with renovating is that you can pick and choose what hours you want to you want to work. Basically, if I want to stay, you know, if I want to have a bath, like muck around in the bath with my daughter, just splashing around for a couple of hours, I can, okay, because I don't have to be somewhere at a set time. If I want to take the day off, I can. You got to remember that tradies aren't docile, okay. If you brief and communicate them properly, they generally can do the job that they're being briefed for. So the big problem is a lot of people don't know how to brief and communicate properly with tradies to get the job done. So it is the perfect occupation for juggling your family commitments around. A lot of my students that come through my program are family, are basically parents. Okay, now one key thing I want to tell you is that professional renovators, they build their wealth faster. Now, I've got two scenarios here. You've got two types of property investors, the passive property investors and what I call the active property investors. Now, I really want you to listen to what I'm going to say because this is pretty fundamental stuff. The traditional property investors are the people that go out and they buy an investment property. Have we got any passive investors here, just people who've got investment properties? Okay, fantastic. Now, don't get me wrong. It's better to be a passive property investor than be no property investor at all. But with passive property investment, what you're doing is you're buying an investment property and you're basically sitting on it. You're playing the waiting game, okay? So you wait two, five, seven, ten years for that asset to grow in value. What typically happens to property every, every seven to ten years? doubles in value. You hope, you pray, right? Not every property doubles in value if you don't... Got to buy in the right place, exactly right. So what, what the, I guess the key thing with traditional property investors, passive property investors, is they're playing the waiting game. Two, five, seven, ten years. In the meantime, what's happening to property prices? They keep moving up, up, up and up, okay? Now, the other type of investor is the active property investors. And what that is, when you, when you, when you realise one is a very slow strategy, one is a very fast strategy. Now, professional renovators, property investors, developers, whatever you want to call us, what it is all about, it's basically about buying a property, so buying an unrenovated property, going in and adding immediate value to that property, okay? And then either renting it out or flipping it for a profit, okay? So instead of waiting two, five, seven, ten years, hoping, praying for capital growth, renovators get in, they add that immediate value to the property straight away. So they're doing it not in years, they're doing it in months, if not weeks, if they're doing a cosmetic renovation. Can you see how one's a very slow strategy, one's a very fast strategy? Now, I do a lot of media interviews. I do one to five media interviews every single day. And a, que a question that I always get asked by the journalists is, you know, Sheree, can you comment? How can first home buyers get a start in property? And my answer to that is, so quite often I'm also doing lots of case studies for individual people for the media. And so what I say is, if you're a young person or if you're somebody that's got very, very limited equity, like not much behind them, or you're starting, you know, starting from a base level, what you shouldn't do, the biggest mistake is actually to go out and buy a traditional passive property investment, because you have to play the waiting game. And as I said, the property prices move. So you're not going to really do much to your wealth position. You're going to get very minimal results by being a passive property investor. What I say for those people with limited equity is go and buy an unrenovated property, get in and do either a cosmetic or a structural renovation, Get your money out, sell it straight away, make a lump sum profit, and you know what? Do it all again. So what I pretty much did in my very first year, I bought that very first renovation. I made that $268,000 profit margin. I took all of that money. I did not spend a dollar, even though it was very tempting seeing your bank account jump up a quarter of a million dollars and very tempting to go on a nice holiday, Paris, whatever it may be, or go for a shopping trip down Tiffany & Co. I resisted the urge to splurge, okay? So what I did is I tipped that whole entire profit 
pro um, profit that I made on that first project, and I tipped it straight into project number two. So suddenly it became much easier. Fin uh, you know, finance was easier to get across the line. Everything became easier. I did project number two. I made a lump sum profit margin again very quickly. I tipped that all of that profit margin into project number three. So I went project one, two, three, four, five, where I just tipped. Tip, tip, tip. By the time I got to project number five, I think it was either project number five or six, guess what position I was in? Not having, Not having to borrow any money. That's exactly right. Do you think cash is king? Yeah. Absolutely. You ring up somebody or you ring up an agent and say, I'll buy this property for 700000 and I, I can basically have the money in your bank account tomorrow. Do you think that's a great motivation for somebody to actually say, yep, do the deal, sign the contract? Of course it is. So... Can you see the difference there with renovating? It's a very aggressive strategy. If you don't want to be a wallflower and just see, hope, pray that your capital growth tricks along, then give renovation a serious go because it, is, it will give you the ability to really accelerate your wealth position at a very fast rate as opposed to a slow rate. I presume you all want to get wealthier faster rather than slower? Yeah, absolutely. Okay, now this, when it comes to renovating, there's two types of renovations. So we're going to very quickly talk about the different types of renovations. You've got cosmetic renos. Now, cosmetic renos are purely just renovations you do to a house that involve a cosmetic facelift. Okay, so they're visual, aesthetic changes only. If you come into a house and you knock out the walls, and you say you go to a rear of a house and you knock out the walls and they're load-bearing, that's not a cosmetic renovation, that's a structural renovation. So cosmetic renos are things like, well, actually, we'll use this room as an example, okay? So cosmetic renovations here... You know, it might be, you know, painting the walls if they didn't have this fabric on them. It might be giving, you know, uh, a new coat of paint. You know, potentially ripping up this carpet, polishing the floorboards if polishing, you know, boards were underneath. You know, changing bathrooms in whole or part. So it's just going in and making properties look a little bit nicer than what they are. I just purely say it's like a facelift. It, really what I do is I almost liken myself to a plastic surgeon. I'm not a plastic surgeon to people. I'm actually a plastic surgeon to houses where all I'm doing in is going in and taking these tired houses and making them look good again. Now, when you're doing cosmetic renovations, and write this down, your timeline for cosmetic renos is six weeks or less. Okay, so six weeks is your timeline to do the actual construction works, and that's what you need at the very most. If you can't do a cosmetic renovation in six weeks, you're probably a bit too slow, okay? So there's lots of people all around the country, thousands of people right across the country, who basically get in and cosmetically renovate a house in like two weeks, okay? In, out, very quickly. And this is the difference. What we're trying to do is we're trying to now take you out of the realm of amateur, hobbyist renovator and start for you to do it in a more professional capacity where you treat it like a business. Why do you think you need to get in and out of your projects very quickly? Any idea why? Holding costs. Holding costs. Every day costs your money. What is every day costing you? So there's different formulas for working that out. When you know that your property is costing you $275 a day, lost profit margin, you'll be amazed at how much quicker and how conscious you are of these timelines. Okay, so the roles that you can play. So six weeks or less, get in, get out very, very quickly. Now, there's a couple of roles that you can play when you're doing a cosmetic reno. The first one is the DIYer. Now, the DIYer is the person that gets in and does all the work themselves. So they're up on a ladder, painting the house, you know, they're in the garden, digging the holes, planting the plants, you know, they might be tiling, whatever it may be. Now, a lot of people think they're actually saving themselves money by being the DIYer, and it actually costs them money. So I'm going to talk about that a little bit later. I never recommend that you ever be the DIYer, okay? It's just, it's a recipe for disaster, and you will hate renovating if you are the DIYer. Has anybody ever made this mistake before, be the DIYer? Okay, that's all right. I see this all across the country. You know, unfortunately, this is not something they educate us in school about. So you have to learn either through experience or through somebody like myself. Okay, the second role that you can play is the DIYer and the project manager. So the DIY and the project. So it's a combination of the two where you do a little bit of the work yourself and also you project manage. You basically bring the tradies in to do a lot of the work. So that's coordinating the both. Now, that's not such a bad role to play, okay, but it's not, I'm definitely not an advocate of that. The third role is where you really need to be, which is the project manager. So even on quick cosmetic renovations, resist the urge to do the work yourself, okay? So what you want to do is you want to be bringing in the tradespeople to basically 
do the work and you're just nothing more than the delegator telling them what needs to be done. The other role is engage a project manager. Now I certainly don't recommend this either. Some people will have no desire to be on site doing coordinating even the work. So you do have the option of bringing in a project manager. But the problem with step number four or that role number four is that you'll find that by the time you get to the end of it and you've paid everything and paid the project management fee to somebody else, there may not be a lot of profit margin left in the deal to actually pay yourself. You're the last one to be paid in the deal. You want to make sure there's a big pot of gold right at the end of it. So I do have a quick, quick question there. Yeah, just um, I'm, I'm probably in the, in the first bracket at the moment. Yep. Because I don't have a lot of cash flow. Yep. Like that, so, um, you're recommending that you just go and get a deal. Yeah, no, try and avoid it. What I say that if you have to be the DIYer because money is absolutely tight, then do it for your very first project, but don't try and do it after for project number two. Absolutely. And I will talk about this a bit later. Okay, this is Jackie. Jackie's um, one of my very early students. She attended my very first Sydney workshop. Now, Jackie was 28 years old. She had absolutely no equity behind her. She came to the workshop with her mum, I guess, for moral support. One of the strategies that I teach my students that come through my program in terms of how to get started with no money is actually borrow money. A very basic strategy is borrow money from your family and friends, okay? Some people probably go, ooh, that's a bit risky. But this is actually how I managed to do six projects in my very first year was by, by borrowing some money from my parents, okay? Not a lot of money. So Jackie did exactly the same thing. Walking out from the workshop, she hit her mum up for a $40,000 loan. So her parents loaned her $40,000. So not a lot, would you agree? A little bit of money, but something to get started with. Now, what Jackie did is, because she was on the lower earnings, she was on about $750 a week, so she was definitely at that lower affordability level. And what she did is she focused, she made her tar one of her target suburbs Wagga Wagga in country New South Wales. Now, Renault's work beautifully in the inner city locations, right across the whole country in every single state. They work beautifully in the inner city rings. They work in the metropolitan suburbs. They work in the outer metropolitan suburbs. They also work fantastic out in the country areas. So Renault's work all over the country. We've got some students all over like strange places, Lightning Ridge doing Renault's. They work everywhere if you know what you're doing. So she focused on Wagga Wagga. Now, is this a sort of normal house that you would see out in the country? Yep, absolutely. This is actually the cosmetic renovation. So this was a quick cosmetic renovation for her before and after. She followed my cookie cutter template, um, which I've developed. So needless to say, there's lots of cream and blue houses going up right across the whole country now. But um, so that's interesting. So anyway, so she bought the, her very first renovation deal. She bought for $160,000. So low end, would you agree? Absolute grassroots level. Now she spent, her total renovation or total project costs were $28,000. So that was everything. Her stamp duty, acquisition, reno costs, resale costs, everything except for capital gains tax, okay? Now she sold that property. So she got in, she did a six week renovation. And she actually sold that property for 205000 So she made a profit margin of $17,000 on her very first renovation. Now, if you look at it in terms of the actual time that she spent on site, it was it created back to almost $3,000 net a week. She was on $750 a week. So there's obviously a very big difference. She tripled her income. Now, you know, some of you might be looking at that $17,000 profit margin and going, why would you bother? 17 grand. Who's, who's in that camp? Okay, so that's fine, that's, your, that's where you are, but there's a lot of people that go, you know what, $17,000 for a six-week cosmetic reno, um, are happy with that. So I guess the point is there, you have to work out what you're comfortable working for. Don't go out trying to make $200,000 profit margin on a quick cosmetic renovation, it's not going to happen. So you have to be realistic. So with cosmetic renos, it's not uncommon to go in and make 20, 30, 50, maybe $100,000 profit margin, maybe more, just depending on the scope of the project, okay? So what cosmetic renos are about, they're quick, quick, quick deals, get in, get out very quickly, lower cost, lower risk, lower profit margins, okay? They're very different to structural renovations. Okay, this is just, um, I've just renovated a house out in Claremont Meadows, out near Penrith in January of this year. So I'm just gonna show you a classic example of what truly a cosmetic renovation is like.
But this was a, a classic example of just a house. Basically, do you know where Claremont Meadows is in between St Mary's and Penrith? And so this was just a normal um, project home that had been built about 20 years ago, so it was starting to look tired. And the property was valued at 345 prior to the renovation. I got in and did a cosmetic renovation inside and out. It took 14 days from start to finish. And the value of that property was 420000 In fact, the agents valued it between 420 to 460. But for the purposes of this exercise, I've taken the most conservative figure. So I added $40,000 profit in basically 14 days. So it is very easy to do this once you have the right knowledge. OK, structural renos. Who potentially is interested in structural renos? OK, fantastic. Now, structural renos will give you the ability to really accelerate your wealth position. Sure, cosmetic renos are great, very quick, ease yourself into it, low risk, lower profit margins. But if you really want to basically change your wealth position very quickly, then you can venture straight into structural renovations. Now, what structural renovations are what you typically call alterations and additions to a property. So you might buy an unrenovated property where the front of the house is okay. You come in and maybe lop a little bit of the back of the house off and you come through and you maybe rebuild a box new wing to the rear of the property or you go up or out, whatever it may be. Quite often a structural renovation can also be as if, if you go through a house and it's very disjointed at the back of the house, you can come through and take out all the load-bearing walls and create open plan living, dining, kitchen room. Have you ever seen that before? Buyers love this. So that is called a structural renovation. Now, structural renovations, there are three key roles. In fact, your timeline for a structural renovation in terms of the actual construction time on site is typically between, what you should be aiming for is between three to eight months, okay? That is your physical time on site, three to eight months. Anything over that is probably too long because with renovations, you want to be turning your money over very, very quickly. Now, three roles that you can do with structural renovations. You can either do a structural reno under your owner builder permit. So right across the whole, right across the country, there are different owner builder permits. In Sydney, for example, it's one owner builder permit every five years. Um, in places like Melbourne, it's one every four, uh, three years. So in, in Sydney, one every five years, okay? Now, this is where you can go, and as an owner builder, you can project manage the whole site without the need for a builder, okay? So that's definitely a great strategy. I've certainly done lots of owner builder projects um, over the course of my, my career. Another great strategy is to engage a builder to what's called lock-up stage. Now, what lock-up stage is basically where a building is built or a you know, house is renovated and it's technically at lock-up. So all the windows, the doors, it's secure, okay? But what you'll find is that it doesn't have any internal fit-out. So the carpet won't be in, the the <clears throat> painting won't be done, the kitchens won't be in. What the builder will leave you is basically the electrical lines hanging through the wall and the plumbing pipes through the wall. And you come in and do the cosmetic fit out. Now that's a great strategy. If you want to save some money and you want to eliminate some risk because you don't have any construction knowledge, Number two is a great strategy because what it does, a builder will come through and build the whole structural shell, which they will be able to do faster and cheaper than you will as a renovator any day. They have the bulk rates on the concrete. They just do it very, very quickly. The time-consuming part for a builder is actually the cosmetic fit-out, the finishing part at the end. Do we have any builders here today in the audience? Okay, would you agree with that, that the time, the fiddly part is the cosmetic fit-out? Yeah, so what you can do is you can get the builder, so you get all your warranties, everything up to the lock-up stage, okay? And then you come in as the cosmetic renovator and you basically take over from there, okay? So that is a great way of saving money. Or if you have no desire to be on site whatsoever, you can actually get a builder to do the whole lot from start to finish. So can you see that regardless of whether you're doing a cosmetic reno or a structural reno, can you see you really have a lot of choices about how much time you do and don't dedicate on site? And that's the beautiful thing about it. Now, can you do a structural renovation? I'm going to ask you these questions. Can you get your kids off to school with their lunch in their bag most of the time? Yeah? Yeah? Be fairly organised. Have you planned a successful party before? Okay. Can you hold down a job? Do you care about people? Do you like bargaining? This is a big thing with structural renos. Where I spend most of my time, I'm on site Monday to Friday, 7 till 3, but you know what? I go home clean at the end of the day. I'm actually not doing any of the work myself, so I'm just there project managing, delegating. 
big part of what I do as a structural renovator is on the phone negotiating. So I'm making 15 phone calls a day saying, these tiles that I need, what's the best price you can give me? I've already been given a price of $50 a square metre by the other supplier. Can you beat that? This is where your time is best spent as a renovator, not being the DIYer. Because if you're up on the ladder painting and planning the plans, you're not going to be on the phone negotiating, negotiating, organising your tradies to be there. So, you know, this is, you've really got to set the two apart because once you understand this, your projects will flourish and you will enjoy renovating a lot more. Okay, can you follow a recipe? Absolutely. Okay, and do you ask for help if needed? It be. So if you, if you can basically do those things, you know what? You're, you're not going to find structural renovations that alarming. Now, this is one of my projects, um, Bradford Street, Balmain. Now, this was a structural renovation. In fact, I think I did this project in year two of my career as a professional renovator. Now, let's be under no false illusions. I had a lot of problems with this property. Unfortunately, this was a cosmetic renovation to the front of the property and it was a structural renovation to the rear. So don't think it always has to be one or the other. You can do a cosmetic a property that's, you know, 90% cosmetic renovation that maybe has 10% structural as well. So it can be a bit of a combination. So this was a combination of the two. Now with this particular property, um, the back section was falling down. It was riddled with termites. So, you know, buyers ran a mile at that as well. I pretty much love termites, concrete cancer, asbestos. I love that. I pay more for those because typically what happens is people run away from those properties. They just think too hard basket. So on this particular property, the back section, some of the walls and some of the floors were caving away. And on this particular property, there were squatters living in the house. Now, I negotiated four months extended settlement on this property, so I had quite a while to settle. And I actually started taking down a couple of walls at the back of the house for public safety risk because these, these squatters were going into the property. So I actually thought I was doing the right thing caring about people. I had lodged the development application in council. I just removed some, a couple of the walls prior to that consent coming through. Needless to say, the neighbour actually rang the council. A ranger came out on site and guess what? I got in trouble. Now, I actually got taken to court for this property because I had taken those walls down prior to consent. I pleaded, I pleaded guilty. I said, Yes, I did that, but I didn't know I shouldn't be doing that. I already lodged a development application. I just, I truly had made a mistake here. Because the reality is, is that, you know, I have you to teach, I, ha I have me, I guess, to teach you what I've learned over the course of 11 years. But the reality was that there was nobody there to teach me. So I've only become Australia's top renovator because... I've been there, I've done that, I've made every single conceivable mistake and I've lived through those experiences. So on this particular property, I got taken to court, I was facing a fine of $1.1 million. So frightening stuff, it was pretty stressful. I ended up going to court, I represented myself because I, I, you know, I knew that I had made a mistake. The way that Leichhardt Council punished me is instead of approving this application in two and a half months, which is their normal lead time, guess what? guess how long it took to get approved? 14 months. They sat on it. They just delayed it. And so when I went to court, the judge said, when did this property get, um, when did the development application get lodged? You know, that was told. And the judge said, why has this girl not got her development application approved? And the judge saw that they were basically digging hardball there. So I walked away with a $3,000 fine. It was the best lesson I'd ever learned. So, you know, if you really don't know what you're doing, you can definitely make some errors with structural renovations. You've just got to, you've got to have the right knowledge. So needless to say, I bought this property for $705,000. Now, the renovation budget on this one was $280,000. So that was the total project cost, everything bar capital gains tax, and I ended up selling that property so, as soon as the renovation was complete. So after that 14 months that it got approved, the physical time on site was three months for this particular project doing the extension to the rear, and that property got sold for um, $1.27 So I made a profit margin of 285000 on this particular project. Now, if that had gone through smooth sailing, that would have been closer to 400000 Okay, So that factors in all those delays with those holding costs. Okay, Australia really is the land of opportunity. So regardless of whether you want to do cosmetic renovations or structural renovation, there's so much opportunity, it is incredible. This house here, have a look at this house here. Let's say this house was a house that you drove past. Is this the sort of house you see all over the place? Okay, absolutely. Would you have driven past here this morning thinking, wow, there's 50 grand to be made on that house? Would you have driven past that thinking that? 
And this is a problem. People go about their life with blinkers on. These opportunities for renovations are literally in every suburb, every single street, you know, all over the place. I don't know if you're anything like me, but back in my 20s, I was always flying to New York trying to look for some business idea that I could bring back to Australia. You know how in America they're like years ahead of us and we're a little bit delayed? So I was always going to New York looking for like anything anything I could get to bring back. And you know what? I used to always just come back and never implement anything. You know, I was coming up with all crazy stuff like um, creative coffins, theme funerals, all sorts of things. For some reason, I was always around the theme of death. Didn't ever end up tending, you know, to be like, just always turned up. But the reality was I came back and never implemented anything, okay? So I went searching far and wide for that magical thing that was going to take me from here to here. And you know what? It was right under my nose in my own street and my own suburb because I had the blinkers on. Which would, does this make sense, what I'm saying? So what I'm showing, I want to show you a collage. Like, Have a look at these images of these houses, okay? And just think to yourself, are these the sorts of properties that lie, that sit on every street, everywhere? Australia is literally an unrenovated country, okay? People say to me, Cherie... Obviously, there's more money in public speaking these days than renovating. I get told that all the time. Well, Cherie, why would you be giving away all your secrets? Aren't you scared that there'll be no deals left? It makes me laugh. I say, are you serious? I could be renovating for the next million years and there'd be plenty of stock. You've got to remember that houses typically need to be renovated every 10 years, 10 to 15 years. Normally, houses need some renovation in one way, shape or form. So don't be scared like the opportunities are out there. Who would agree with me that renovation is not an airy-fairy wealth concept? Would you agree with that? Like we're talking about real stuff here, real opportunities. When you, look at the, when you look at renovation, you've also got to do not complicated, okay? Yes, there is a process. There's a system to getting it right, but it's not complicated. When you look at it in a, in a very high level, you know, renovation is just about people. And really, it's a marriage between marrying a person or people with a property, okay? So if you can understand that concept, keep that in, at the top of your mind. You're going to do well in your property projects. Now, what I want to talk to you about now is the four phases of renovating. Now, as I said, under this, I have my eight-step system, okay? For the purposes of today, I've simplified that down into four key phases because I don't want to bamboozle you too much. So what I'm going to do now is for the next half an hour or so, I'm going to give you some really good tips that you can go out and start to think about the concept of renovating and whether or not it's, not, it's a wealth strategy for you. So the first thing is this. Now, the first phase is the preparation phase. Now, under my eight-step system, System. The first four steps sit under phase one. And phase one is all about the preparation phase. Everything that you do before you actually buy a property, there's actually a lot involved. Unfortunately, everybody thinks, everybody thinks renovating is the, they always think the construction component. And the construction component is only one step of the eight steps, okay? It's actually the smallest part. So here's a couple of key tips. Now, what I'm going to share with you don't feel that you can walk out of this room today and be very successful in renovating with what I give you today. It's impossible to give you everything in two days. I run three-day workshops and it's impossible to give them everything even in those three-day workshops. So I'm just going to give you some high-level tips, as I said, something for you to go away and start to implement. Okay, so the first thing. So now talking about what you do before you buy a property. The first thing is to become a master of one, not a jack of all trades. Have you ever heard that saying before? So what I want you to do is I want you to zoom down and I want you to choose one suburb. If your suburb is big enough, one suburb. When I say big enough, I mean stock turning over, okay? So I focus on one suburb. But if your suburb's not big enough, a maximum of three suburbs. So what you're aiming to do is you're aiming to now zoom in and become an expert in one select area. And what you need to do with those one to three target suburbs that you do select, make sure they are geographically located close together. Any idea why? Definitely time and one, one other thing that I'm looking for. Uh, that's, that's another thing. Different councils, different rules. But there's one other main thing. Yes, I mean, that is definitely one reason as well. Makes it easier. No? 
you know what, I'm going to save you the pain, all right? Um, the demographics, the change in the transition in demographics. Would you say, for example, if we use Sydney as an example, would you say the people in Balmain um, are different to the people in, say, Pimble? Yes? Would you say the people in Pimble are different to the people in Cronulla? Yeah. Absolutely. So what you want to do is you want to just zoom in and focus on one to three suburbs. So what you're looking for is a cluster of suburbs. If you pull a map out, you need to be able to say, draw a circle and say, that's my turf. Okay. So what you're going to do is you're going to zoom in, you're going to focus your efforts and you're going to start to specialise in something, in an area. Do you think if you zoom in and focus and specialise on a, select, a small number of suburbs, do you think you've got a much better chance of actually being more successful? Absolutely. It's like anything in life. You spread your wings too far, you don't do anything well. When you zoom in and focus and get to become an expert in that suburb, that's when you'll do well. This is not rocket science, okay? Is this hard? But unfortunately, people just lack focus. Would you agree with that? Okay, so this is the reason why I became so successful in renovating is because I just focused. So if a property comes up that's outside of my one to, two, one to three target suburbs, am I either going to go and bother looking at it? No, because as soon as you step outside your one to three target suburbs, you're making assumptions about the demographics, you're making assumptions about the purchase price, the resale price, all sorts of things. So don't ever put yourself in a position of risk. Do things, move forward with knowledge, the right knowledge, so you don't um, basically get caught or tripped up anywhere along the line. Okay, understand the demographics. You have to, once you've selected your one to three target suburbs, you have to zoom in and there is a process, I call this step number two, suburb due diligence, of getting to know everything about that suburb. You need to get intimate with your suburbs, okay? Know who are the people that are living there, what, what you know, makes them tick, you know, what are the positive attributes of the suburb, the negative, all those sorts of things, okay? Now, part of that process is understanding the demographics. Why on earth would you need to have an understanding of the demographics if you're renovating? Absolutely. So you have to match your renovation to the buyer's needs. You know what? My renovation projects are a product. I never get emotional about my properties. I'm creating a product like any other business owner, okay? And all I'm doing is I'm creating a product that perfectly suits the customer. The customer is the demographics. Now, we're all the single fellas. We've got any single fellas in the audience? Okay, beautiful. All right, one of my target suburbs, Roselle, has the highest proportion of single females than in any other suburb of Australia. So you know we need to start hanging out now, all right? <laughs> Sunday morning. <laughs> okay, so can I assume you're all trainee renovators now? Can I assume that? Okay. As renovators, let's say an unrenovated house comes on the market and it's in Roselle and you know that you're going to be selling this, unrenovate, this renovated house to a single female. As renovators, what would you be putting into that property to cater to her every woman need? Yell it out. Bathroom and kitchen? Security. Security. Have we got any single ladies in the audience? Any single ladies? Single ladies meet single fellas. Okay. <laughs> I love playing Cupid. Okay. So, secure, um, so would you say security is a big issue for a single person? Absolutely. So if you're renovating a house to a single female, you want to make sure there's a security door on the front, the back. You want to make sure there's window locks so they can sleep at night and have peace of mind. You know, the reality is if you're catering an unrenovated property to a single female, yeah, Go and do the sex in the city wardrobes if space allows and the budget allows. So she walks in and goes, oh my goodness, look at this. Because what you can do is one, once you understand the demographics and what makes them tick, it's very easy for you then actually to install things in their property that get them emotionally connected, okay? Make no mistake about it. Renovators target owner-occupiers. They do not target investors, okay? And you want to target people, owner-occupiers. You want to get them emotionally connected to your property so they want to buy it. So things like the lights over the bath, you know, making sure you have a bath. Females love baths, okay? Big mistake to ever sell a house without a bath if you're targeting a female. So can you see, once you understand the demographics of who you're going to be targeting, the questions of how do I renovate, what do I put into the renovation become a lot, lot easier. Is this hard? Okay. Create a due diligence system. What in the hell is that? Due diligence, what is that? Any idea? 
research. So what a due diligence system is, you have to create a professional research system that gives you the ability to make very quick decisions when unrenovated properties come on the market. I'm just going to show you my due diligence system. This is actually, um, in fact, it's actually blank. I don't share the contents of this with anybody but my students. I can honestly say it is this plastic folder that made me a millionaire, okay? The reason being is that I can go, I'm such an expert in my suburb through my due diligence system that I can literally tell the value of properties within a twenty to $30,000 range, okay? So what I do is, one thing that you have to do is you have to start attending the open for inspections, okay? And collecting the agent's brochures. You know the brochures that they give you at the door on the property? You need to start collecting those. So I would set aside a time of about 12 weeks to start undergoing that process. You'll find at the end of that three months, if you start attending the open for inspections for the three months, you'll actually get a very good idea of property pricing, but that's not enough. You can't come home on a Saturday afternoon after going through 10 open for inspections, come home on a Saturday afternoon and then just plonk all those real estate agents' brochures in the corner of your room or on your office desk, okay? That's not going to give you the ability to make calculated, quick decisions. What I do is, let's say, for example, an unrenovated house comes on the market. Let's say Chris rings me up, the real estate agent, says, Cherie, actually no, sorry, what's your name? Brad. Okay, Brad, let's say Chris, the real estate agent, rings you up and says, Brad, an unrenovated house has just come on the market in, say, Balmain. They want $600,000. You know, are you interested? So what do you think the first thing you're going to do once you get that phone call? What's the first thing do you think? Uh, if I was smart and I was using that, I would go back and compare previous sales histories to work out if it was over or under price. Okay, cool. And how would you, where would you get that information? Let's assume you don't have this because most people don't have this. So what would you normally do right now? What would you normally do? Yes, RP data. So what most people do is this. When they get those sort of phone calls, typically the first thing they do is they go and they look at the property first. So they'll arrange an inspection. They'll go and have a look at it. And then what they do, let's say they go through the property and they say, yeah, this property looks good. I'm potentially interested. The first thing they normally do is they go back home or they go back to work or their office, whatever it may be, and they jump online and they start doing, like, they search domain.com.au, they search what properties have sold for in the suburb, in the, in particularly in the street. They order some of those online reports, like Home Price Guide, RP Data, if they have that, the RP Data reports, where you pay, like, you know, 60 or $80 for a suburb report that has all the street sales. So would you agree that's what most people would do? Now, how long does that process normally take for you to actually feel comfortable to then submit an offer on a property? What do you think the normal lead time for that process is? It's normally somewhere between three to four days to a week. For most people to feel confident of their knowledge of what that property is worth, it's normally, you know, three or four days to a week. Now, when I get that phone call from Chris, the real estate agent, yeah, I'll go out and inspect the property. Sometimes I don't if I can pull it up on RP Data. Sometimes I don't even need to inspect the property. So it's about having the right tools. But as soon as I get that phone call, I go straight to my due diligence system. I can instantly tell within the space of a couple of minutes what I should be paying for that property. And I will know at the same time what I'm also going to be selling that property for within a reasonable range. I've actually then submitted an offer within half an hour and taken that property off the market while most of you are still on the internet trying to convince yourself what the property is worth. I'm not trying to be hard or facetious here. I'm just trying to paint a picture of the difference between people who do property professionally and as a business, what they do and how they go about things, as opposed to amateurs, people who do renovation or dabble in property as a hobby. So what, we, what we're trying to do is we're trying to take you out of that league of amateur hobbyists and we're now trying to put you into a position where you're treated like a professional. Because let me tell you, I will get treated very, very differently as a professional renovator with the real estate agents than what you will as an amateur hobbyist. Would you agree with that? Okay, so there's lots of things you can do to build that credibility, to build that status, even when you're first starting out. So you have to use, you have to use a property due diligence system to be able to give you this information of what a property is worth. And it doesn't matter even if you have no desire to do renovating, even if you just want to do passive property investment, just buy property, hold them, or development, you still need a due diligence system, okay? I'm just going to show you why the due diligence system. Some of you might be thinking, it's just a folder. Anybody thinking that at the moment? Okay, good. Um, <laughs> we're on a good track. I'm going to show you why you need a due diligence system, okay? Uh, I, I presume most of you are familiar with Balmain. Yeah, anybody not know Balmain here? 
Okay, all right, so it's not far away. It's only five kilometres, you know, down the street. Um, this is Darling, you all know Darling Street. So Darling Street is just, you know, it's the main thoroughfare through the guts of the suburb. Not an eight-lane highway, just one lane each way, so two-lane road, um, artery. Now, have a look at this. See this street here, Mort Street? I've just plucked this street out as an example. This is one property that I own at the moment. So from this corner here, so along this strip, sorry, along this strip is shops, you know, clothes shop boutiques, um, cafes, restaurants, a few pubs scattered, like trendy bars, um, but mainly just, you know, sort of arty-farty, um, creative boutique shops, okay? So my suburb is what you call a lifestyle suburb. Now, Maud Street, from this corner to this corner here is about 400 metres, and from this corner to this corner here is about 800 metres, okay? Now, all the houses along Maud Street are fairly consistently three or four bedroom family homes, so the housing style in that particular street is fairly consistent. Now, the property values from this corner to this corner, on average, range from about 1.4 to 2 million, you know, maybe low twos, right across for these three and four bedroom family homes. From this corner to this corner, you know, only 50 metres away or 100 metres away, very short distance away, they even struggle to reach 900,000. Same size homes still struggle to reach 900,000. Why? They're too close to the shops. Have you ever heard that saying, be close to the infrastructure? Have you ever heard of that? Okay, that's true, but you don't ever want to be too close to the infrastructure. What happens here is that people come down Darling Street and they look to basically park in all the side streets. So needless to say, all these properties along here all have traffic, congel traffic congestion problems, okay? So my recommendation is that you don't ever buy within one block from a main artery, okay? Because you'll have that traffic congestion issue. So what happens is people park over people's driveway, they scream at each other, you know, neighbours get frustrated. Have you ever seen that people arguing, saying, you parked over my driveway, I couldn't get out? Have you ever seen or heard those sorts of situations? And let's not even mention all the bugs, the cockroaches, the rats, from all the food scraps in the lanes, from all those shops, okay? Most people don't even think about these basic things. So needless to say, all these properties that flank all the sort of the, the retail strips, they have a higher incidence of pest control problems, okay? Now let's say uh, you come in, you're an ex inexperienced renovator, you think you're good at property investment, you come in, so let's say Joe and Lucy come through on a Saturday morning and unrenovated properties come up right here. Number 23 Mort Street's come on the market. Joe and Lucy come through and they go, oh, this property looks like it's got good potential, cosmetic renovation, whatever it may be. They go, okay, 850. Joe and Lucy go home, back, back home that afternoon. They jump on the online systems, RP data, home price guides, whatever it may be. And they go, well, well, number 42 Mort Street sold for 1.45 million. Number 67 sold six months ago for 1.95 million. Number 72 sold for... Uh, 1.75 million, gee, there's a lot of 1.6, 1.7, 1.8 sales along here, only 50 metres away. Gee, they're only asking 850,000 for this property. That seems cheap. Let's buy it. We'll get in and renovate it, Joe. We'll spend 100 grand renovating it. We should be able to easily sell it for 1.5 million based on these properties that are only 50 metres away. Can you see where you can make fundamental mistakes? And that's why having those tools like RP Data, Home Price Guide, yes, they're great tools, but you cannot rely solely on those because what they don't pick up is the negative and the positive price pockets that can happen even within the same street. Is it fair to say that you can have radically different property values in the same street? Yep. Of course you can. This is a classic example. The property range, the property prices here struggle to get over a million dollars. Here, they're 1.4 to 2, you know, 2.1, 2.2 million dollars along here. And as the same street twists around to the waterfront, I mean, these waterfront properties notch up to the three to four million dollar mark, all within the same street. So this is why you have to be, regardless, as I said, regardless of whether you're gonna be a property investor, a renovator or a developer, you need a smart due diligence system behind you so you never ever pay too much for a property ever again. You also need the ability from that system to know what you're going to be reselling so you can actually go into these properties with confidence that you're going to come out with a profit margin right at the end. Does that make sense? Okay. Pre-purchase research. Did you know there's about 60 things that you should research on a property before you actually buy it? 
Most people, when they go to buy a property, they organise a building and a pest inspection. They may go into council if you're lucky. And they give the legal contract to their lawyer saying, here you go, can you please tell me if there's anything quirky in the contract that I should be aware of? Would you agree with that? They might drive up and down the street, look at the surrounding houses, and that's pretty much the extent of due diligence that most people do. What I've developed is these checklists. Um, as I said, I'm very systems orientated, and what I de uh, developed is these checklists that basically list all the 60 things that you should research at a property level. So what you basically do is if you are going to use my system, what you do is you come through, when you're looking at a property, you go, okay, that one, I've done that. Yes, I've researched that. Tick, tick, tick. So there's pretty much a tick system, okay? So if you follow these checklists, what it'll do is it means that you'll never, ever forget anything ever again. I'll just give you some examples. You know, do a council search. Before you go into a property, do a council search. Find out if anybody's lodged a DA on the property before. What zoning is it? Is there any flooding issues? Have they earmarked it for some sort of change in the future? Like really basic things, but people just don't do these basic things. It's, it's really terrible. So you'd use those checklists to basically um, make sure that you never use a lemon again, buy a lemon again. All right. Did you know, so we're still looking at what you do before you buy the property, did you know that there's over 100 ways that you can add value to a property? So before you buy a property, you should work out what you can actually do to it. Work out if there's enough scope of work to you to actually add value to it. For a cosmetic renovation, there's lots of formulas with renovating and property investment. One example, for example, is that if you're buying a cosmetic renovation, you have to add 36% back in order to cover all your costs, make your desired profit margin. So if you're buying a property at 100,000, how much do you need to resell it for? 136,000 to cover all your costs, make your desired profit margin, okay? So there's lots of formulas that you need to stick to. But, so when you go into your property projects, you have to identify the 100 ways, at least, you know, where can you add value? If you can only add a couple of ways, you're not probably going to get that 36%. So I'm going to share with you today just a couple of ways that you can add value to a property, and we'll just look at these from a cosmetic renovation perspective. So the easiest way is simply just to modernise, okay? Now, who owns this house? Who owns this house? Oh, but Nanny and Poppy own this house, okay? Now, these tend to be the best deals because what happens is Nanny and Poppy, they don't work and they tend to maintain these, their properties in meticulous condition. You see them all the time. You drive the streets and you see Grandpa up on a ladder painting a wall that doesn't even need painting, all right? They're just passing time. So quite often what you do is you'll go through these properties. These properties come on the market and they are in meticulous condition. Perfect bones. This is what I call, is this property here a property with good bones? Okay, structurally beautiful. The problem is it's just tired, it's dated. Now Nanny and Poppy have a problem. Nanny and Poppy bought this house for $50 50 years ago, right? That we know. Nanny and Poppy have become very wealthy on capital growth. In fact, this was just a little two-bedroom semi in Leica that was on the market about six months ago, 850000 okay? I guarantee you Nanny and Poppy bought this probably for 20000 whatever it may be back then. So Nanny and Poppy have become intrinsically wealthy through capital growth alone. They've just sat on these properties forever. Now the problem is they're asset rich, but what problem do Nanny and Poppy have? They're cash poor. So they, they, they maintain their house in perfect condition. They, you know, they, they're just meticulous. But the problem is they have no cash or no inclination to actually renovate them at all. So these opportunities pop on the market all the time. And they're great ones for you to go in and buy if they come up on the market for sale or auction because there's very low risk involved. Now, renovators, yell out, what would you do to this room? Strip the carpet. <coughs> Polish the floors, repaint. new lights, repaint. Yeah, is this hard? Higher furniture? What's wrong with the furniture? <laughs> Actually, look at the furniture. Nanny and Poppy are quite creative. Look, they match the carpet to the lounge <laughs> to the curtains. Well, that were good. So this is what I do. As a professional renovator, this is what I wouldn't, would do. In fact, I'm going to test you. What would you do with that fireplace? I ask this question all the time. I speak across the country every single week and half the audience says rip it out, half says keep it, but they don't know what to do to it. So I'm going to talk to you about what I do. First of all, I would rip out these, these curtains. Now, what am I going to do with those curtains? <laughs> I'm not going to make a dress out of them, all right? 
Those curtains will be sold in what's called your demolition sale, okay? When you go in and buy these unrenovated properties, again, because we haven't been taught this information at school, most people's instant reaction is to throw it all in the mini skip bin, okay? I rip out everything from my project. That carpet, the curtains, the light, everything gets sold. That's what you call a demolition sale. That is money coming back into your feasibility. Yes, I may only get $10 for those car curtains and I may get $40 or $50 from that carpet, but you know what? It's $50 in my pocket, not somebody else's. So you'd be amazed at what you can strip out from these internal, these old houses. So I would rip the curtains out. I would install some white plantation shutters because they make any property look hot. I would actually get my painter to come through and put a fresh lick of white paint on the ceiling to freshen it up. Now these picture rails, go or stay? They stay. You're going to paint those picture rails gloss white. Gloss surfaces have higher perceived value than matte or satin surfaces. So your painter is going to come in and say, Cherie, you know, paint them matte or satin because they won't show the defects. Yes, that's true, but you know what? It'll have lower perceived value. So your objective with your renovations is to have everything shiny, shiny, sparkling, so it looks brand new, okay? So white gloss paint on the skirting boards, the architraves. Do you need to rip out those skirting boards? No, see, they're in perfect condition. That's where you don't need to spend money, okay? So you need to be smart enough to know what is truly going to add value, and there's some formulas that you can work that out, whether something stays or go. Okay, well, what am I going to do with the carpet? I'm going to rip it up, and I guarantee you there's some beautiful floorboards waiting to be brought to life, okay? I'm going to basically start, I'm going to floor sand those, um, I'm not me personally, those floors are going to be uh, sanded and polished. I'm going to polish them a darker colour, not a lighter colour. Darker floorboards have higher perceived value than lighter floorboards, okay? So once you know all these things, it's very easy to sort of get people to think you've actually spent more money on your renovation than what you really have. Okay, the fireplace. Sandstone is a building material that has high perceived value, so it'd be a big mistake to rip that out. What I would do in this case is I'd go to Bunnings, I'd buy a tin of white heatproof paint, I'd paint that, surround, uh, that insert, I'd get my painter to put a coat of white gloss paint on the top of that. It is done. All right? Um, just on that, I was supposed to house person with this one. Yep. What do you do with the fireplace when it's in a, a bad um, area for the room? Why? Yes, so it's, it's a, an, an obstruction. It's Yep. So sometimes you have to rip them out, okay? Because if you, particularly if you're going to be altering the house some way or putting in some walls or taking out something, then sometimes the fireplaces, quite often they're in the hallways as well, where they're just, they're suddenly your one metre hallway becomes 600. So sometimes you have to take them out, but you need to have a chat to council about that. It is an internal change that would technically be classed as a cosmetic reno, but some councils will say it's a structural reno. So you always, if in doubt, always check with council. Okay, so I'd basically um, paint the fireplace. The light, I'm going to take that out. I'm going to sell it. I'm going to go to one of those cheap little lighting shops that you see out in the burbs, and I'm going to you know, spend $200 on a cute little chandelier. That room will look a million bucks, okay? So how long should that take you? Probably a week because... The reason why you need a week is because that's how long it's going to take for the set for floor sanding. That's the biggest time delay there. If you are actually just not floor sanding and you're coming in and replacing just the carpet, that is an overnight job. All right, so get in very quickly. Get all your tradespeople in, okay, within reason. Okay, cement render. Another great way to add value to a property, just you know, a couple of ways out of the 100 plus ways, is to cement render. Now, again, is this the sort of house you see all over the place? particularly in the outer metropolitan, not so much in the city, but in the outer metropolitan suburbs on the lowest price point, these sorts of houses are very common. It looks ugly, right? Not overly attractive. What about now? Still looks a bit ugly, right? Hasn't been painted, but does it look better? Yeah. With my knowledge, with my construction knowledge now, that would have cost about 3500 Has that added more than $3,500 in perceived value? So there's perceived value versus actual cost, all right? What about this one? Very tired house. Probably fair to say this is probably 20, 30 years old. Would you agree with that? Okay. They've now cement rendered and painted. Looks like an entirely different house, doesn't it? I mean, that would have cost probably somewhere around the 10000 mark for the cement render, but that has added more than $10,000 of perceived value. So as renovators, as property investors, you need to know where to spend money and where not to spend money. Okay, improved landscaping, another great way to add value. These are like really quick things that you can do. Another way is to improve the landscaping. Now, does this courtyard do anything for you emotionally? 
Like, is it, is it saying, come and sit with me on the weekend? Is it? No. What about now? Simple cosmetic changes. So what you're doing is you're taking drab areas and you're making them into fab areas, okay? Not so nice areas into nice areas. Because what it's doing, like this now, it would appeal to you emotionally, wouldn't you? You'd start envisaging yourself actually with a little deck chair or a couple of banana lounges, whatever it may be, sitting out there with, the weekend, with a, a, an umbrella on the weekend and you can see yourself sitting out there. The, the one previously, you wouldn't just, you wouldn't do it. So it's really not that hard. This is two of my students, Jazz and Chena, they did one of my earlier workshops. They bought a property in Parramatta. You all know Parramatta, okay? So they bought this property for around, I think it was 475 they bought it for. In fact, it actually had another little house behind it. So they actually did a cosmetic renovation into two houses on the one block. Now, they took a little bit longer on this one. It was their very first reno, so I didn't go too hard on them, but um, four months from start to finish. And they sold both properties. They, made, they walked away with a $120,000 profit margin, yeah. So, you know, don't think, I'm showing you properties, my examples are just way up here in terms of price range, you know, I'm competing in a much more premium suburb, but you really don't have to beat these high prices, you can really start at absolute um, grassroots level. Okay, so that's just a couple of key pointers for some things to get your head around in the preparation phase. Okay, the procurement phase. This is what you do to actually acquire the property. There's a whole heap of strategies that you need to be aware of in there. But what professional renovators do, renovators, professional investors and property developers, what they do is they use creative negotiations. What we do is we make our own rules, okay? And this is about putting your ability to put a creative hat out and on and think about, think outside the square, okay? So I've done this consistently um, over the last 10, 11 years, and it can really mean the difference between you, between you doing very well and not doing well. So use creative negotiations. Things like paying minimal deposit. I've never, ever paid 10% deposit on any property. Never have, I never will. At the very most, I've paid 5%. Is there anybody that's actually paid less than 5% before in the audience? No? Nobody? Okay, so I speak around the country every single week. You know, a lot of the time, hands go up and say, you know, I put $100 to pound, $1,000, $5,000. So all you need to do is ask the questions. If you don't ask the questions, you won't receive, okay? So minimal deposit is a fantastic way. Extended settlement. So what I do is I use this consistently on every project. So when I buy a property, I negotiate four months extended settlement. And what that means is that as soon as I get the keys, I am lodging that development application for that structural renovation in, like I pretty much say, when the contract sign, I ring my architect, my surveyor, say go, here's project number 26, whatever it may be. They go out, the DA is done in two weeks, it's lodged in council two weeks after I've signed the contract and my development application is approved basically, you know, within a week or two of me actually settling. So I always aim so that I'm ready to start construction on the day I get the keys. Can you see how I'm utilising time effectively? If I didn't do that, what would happen is I'd actually be wasting two, three months of holding costs because every dollar you save is an extra dollar of what earned? Profit, absolutely. Make no mistake about it, profit is the name in the renovating game. Do you avoid suburbs like No. Well, and this is part of your suburb due diligence, knowing what is the situation in your own individual suburbs. There's some suburbs in Australia, like Byron Bay, you have to wait two years. So you need to basically work out what is the norm in your suburb. And that's, it's all part of your knowledge of building that step number two, that suburb due diligence. Okay. Minimal deposit, extended settlement, immediate access. So technically, if you can get a vendor to agree to it, you can go in and say negotiated three months extended settlement, and if you can get immediate access, you can get in and renovate a house cosmetically, finish it within six weeks, and still have six weeks to basically settle. You can bring the bank in at the six week mark, and they'll actually value the property on the new improved value, not the original purchase price. Now, not every bank will know this, will let you allow you to do this. So you need to know which banks do this and which ones don't. Okay, so lots of lots of things that you can do, you know, releasing deposit to the vendor. There's so many creative negotiations you can do to get the deals across the line. I'm going to talk about that a little bit later as well. Okay, do a financial feasibility. Most people go into a property and they do not crunch the numbers before they buy a property. They just 
Hope it wings out. They pray, hoping things work out. You can never do that. So you have to do a financial feasibility. Pretty much um, 10 years ago, because I am systems orientated, 10 years ago, I developed a financial feasibility. It didn't actually look like this. It was just a very simple Microsoft Excel spreadsheet. And what I did is I logged all the costs that I incurred on an individual basis into that Excel spreadsheet. Moving into project number two, any costs that were missing from that, I added to my Excel spreadsheet. Needless to say, my feasibility is now almost 3,000 line items. It's been a labour of love for literally 10, 10, uh, 10 years. So last beginning of last year when I first started speaking, I actually spent another two months making this thing look pretty for my students. So basically what I say is that you, know, you should always absolute rule is that you should always crunch the numbers to work out whether or not a property is actually going to be a profitable deal for you. Do you think it's, pos do you think it's possible, oh sorry, I'll rephrase it, do you think you can make a profit margin on every single unrenovated property? No, so you need to be smart enough to know which ones are, which ones are the diamonds and which ones are the duds. I've also developed, so obviously people get that that comes through my program. Now, I've also developed these, these, these calculators. In fact, I am officially the template queen of Australia, no joke. And so every week I create, if I'm bored, I'll go, what, what template can I create? I'm a bit crazy, a bit demented like that, okay? And so I've actually created all these templates as part of my system so that you can actually calculate within the space of a minute or two whether or not a property is going to stack up from a profitability perspective. Again, most people don't educate themselves with these systems and they just go in and they hope that it works out. You just can't be in that position. All right. Stand out to the banks. Do you think right now, you know, the market's a bit flat at the moment. Don't be scared when the market's flat. In fact, when the market's flat, that is the best time to renovate, okay? Tradies are quiet, material suppliers are quiet, so they're more willing to negotiate. So don't freak out about that too much. But in these tough times, would it be fair to say the banks are tightening up, getting a bit more harder to get money from? Has anybody tried to get finance lately? Yeah? Would you say they're tightening up, getting harder? Yeah, absolutely they are. So what I do is, I'm going to show you just one thing, one way that I help to get my finance across the line, okay? Now, in my system, like I said, I don't consider myself the smartest person on the planet, okay? I'm just your average girl next door. But what I'm very good at doing is doing things that other people don't even think to do, okay? And this is one classic example of what I'm going to show you. I produce a finance proposal for the bank, on the property that I'm buying, okay? Now, it's just you go to Officeworks, you just buy one of these four or five dollar folders, presentation folders from Officeworks. Um, so this is now a template in my, one of the templates in my system. Um, so what I do is I basically do this, and I'll just quickly go through this. So I have this title page that lists the contents. The first section is the applicant, because the bank wants to know, who is Cherie Barber? Who is she? So it's got here my identification. I know the banks are gonna say, can I have 100 points of identification? We know that, right? So instead of them having to ask me, I have all of that for them already there. So it's got my ID, it's got my expertise. So I talk about how I'm an expert in my target suburbs. I have um, you know, anything relating to my company, my organisational charts, my business, you know, my certificate of incorporation, whatever it may be, I'll have that through there. I have my assets, I list my assets, my liabilities. I have a copy of my credit reference file, okay? Your financial transaction history on yourself. Um, I have my bank statements, you know, the last three months of bank statements. So I'm preempting everything the bank is going to need in that very first section. The second su section is suburb due diligence. And this is where I'm convincing the bank about how I'm an expert. I know everything there is to know about this suburb. Now, the beautiful thing about this is that a lot of the templates in my system basically feed into all many things in my system. So a lot of the things are interlinked. You use the same checklist in a whole heap of things, the finance proposals, the spotters fees, the valuers reports, all, sort of, all sorts of things. So all you have to do is print out the checklist from the system, basically tick them, so you can really create a lot of these ones. Also got things like the, you know, the demographics. I mean, here's an example, media clippings. One of the things I teach my students is start reading your local papers, start collecting all those neighbourhood watch bulletins, collect them in your target suburb and keep them. So when you're trying to convince the bank to lend you a million dollars to buy a, a home that can be a potential family home, I'm supporting it with media evidence that there is a demand for family homes in the local area. If you look at this one here, this, this particular clipping from one of the newspapers says, Balmain's baby booms. So the, the finance people, the people in the credit department will read it and go, well, yeah, actually there, looks, there seems to be, from the media evidence here, there needs, seems to be a demand from here. So what the purpose of this finance proposal is doing, it's 
painting a picture that, hey, Cherie is doing this professionally. She's not some random person who doesn't know her stuff. It's just, you know, this pop, this idea has popped into her head to buy a property. She's done thorough property due diligence. She's clearly an expert in her suburb. This deal is a good deal. It seems like we're never going to lose any money. This looks like it's a low-risk project. Can you see that? So, you know, anything, you know, and I just, you know, cut out pictures from like the cafes or whatever, or the, you know, the pit, go photograph the local train station, say close to infrastructure, whatever it may be. You can see those sorts of things, okay? I also print out the demographics reports. So I teach my students how to pull this information free from the internet. You're just convincing a story. The, set, the third section is the property due diligence section, and this is now about the property. So can you see what we're doing? First of all, I've covered me, who's Cherie. The second section is about the suburb. So convincing them in that regard. The third section is actually now the property. So it's got the agent's brochure. It's got, you know, the floor plans. It's got property images. So you go around and take all these pictures with your camera. It has all your sales comparables. Now, this is where your due diligence system comes in. What you want to do is you want to go back to your property due diligence system and you want to start pulling out and photocopying the agent's brochures of similar properties that are sold for higher prices, okay? So they can see that these other properties have sold. So it starts to elevate the price of your property, okay? Okay, so that goes out. And if you don't have that, how on earth can you produce these sorts of things? Okay, the SAR so it's got a lot, you know, property due diligence checklist all pulled from the system. Tick, 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 tick. I've done that, done that, beautiful. And the last section is the project outcomes. So, what are you actually going to do with this property? So, you know, if you started the commence, if you started doing structural drawings, or you know, you've, you've got some high level sketches from your draftsman, whatever it may be, you basically put it in that section. You basically point out what you're going to be doing. You might even just pull some random stuff like color schemes and whatever. You're just painting the dream, okay? You also pull the financial, the, the quick calculators, they can see it's going to stack up. You know, you print out a copy of the financial feasibility, that goes in, and then obviously at the end you've got, um, you know, building contracts and some of the construction stuff, so they can see who your trade team's going to be working on. So yes, it takes about half a day to sort of produce that. Obviously you only have to produce it once and then you've got a, you know, 80% template there according to your own needs, and that gets submitted to the bank. Now, every time I've used that, my finance has always got approved. Every time my students have used this, their finance has got approved. Now, would you say most people do this? Absolutely not. Is this, like, mind-blowing? No. Very simple stuff, but most people don't think to do this stuff. So, as I said, a large part of why I've been successful is because I just do a lot of stuff that other people don't think to do. Yes. No, so brokers all, all straight to the banks. So what you don't want to do is you don't ever want to ring up those mobile banking hotlines, you know, those one three hundred numbers, because when you ring up those telephone lines, it doesn't give you the ability to sell that, okay? When those banking hotlines, you have to fit into the system. If you've got a yes or no answer, it's boom, rejected. So don't ever... So I guess this is part of step number five where I teach you know, which banks to go to, you know, which banks are more friendly for renovators, investors, developers, and the types of things that you need to be doing. So there's, a, the, you know, as I said, not all banks are equal. Okay, know your limits. You have to know what a property is worth. A lot of people take what the agent says to them as gospel. I'm going to show you this property here. You may, I don't know if you ever recall seeing this property. It was back in 2003, I think this one, or 2002. In fact, this is my all-time favourite property. I guess it's my favourite property is because I got ridiculed so much beyond this with this property. It was it was un unbelievable. But I ended up having the last laugh. Now, at this stage, when this property went to auction, I was today tonight's renovator. Um, I'd been you know there renovated for a couple of years, so I was very well known in my suburb as the Balmain renovator. And um, this this little shack, uh, it was. It is basically a property, like it literally was a two-bedroom shack that had stood still for eight years. Nobody had lived in the house, so it was slightly derelict and a very small house. Now the agent was quoting five hundred to five hundred and fifty thousand. I paid seven hundred and twenty thousand. So I made page three of the new, of the Sydney newspaper because it sold for one hundred and seventy thousand over reserve if you base it on the five fifty. Now I was at the auction, and throughout the auction, I could hear people saying, "Oh my goodness." I can't believe the price this property is going for. I could hear sniggering little comments like that. When that auction hammer went down, like people just, like people at the auction were just going, oh, I can't believe it. Like, you know, have you ever been to those auctions where people just go, what are they thinking? Like, what are they doing? Anyway, that auction hammer went down. And because people knew, my, knew me in that area as being the Balmain Renovated, people came up to me at the auction and went, 
do you know how much that property, what the agent was quoting for that property? They're only quoting 500, 550,000. Why on earth would you pay so much for that property? People come out and saying, you paid too much, you idiot. You paid too much. Like, I got so much ridicule, it was embarrassing, like, particularly with all the neighbours and all sorts of things. And in fact, I dis very distinctly remember this one conversation once. I was up on Darling Street and I ran into this old lady that I sort of knew, sort of didn't know, and she said to me, oh, love, did you see that little house that sold down the road? Whoever bought that was a real idiot, weren't they? And I just sort of went, like, crawled away going, I didn't have the heart to say, hey, it was actually me. But I knew what this property was worth. At the end of the day, yes, that two-bedroom shack was only worth five hundred to 550000 if it was going to remain a two-bedroom house. But as a four-bedroom Two bathroom plus study family home, it was worth significantly more. So, needless to say, I got a lot of rid ridicule, embarrassing, okay? And, I, and in fact, back at that time, I knew what this property was worth, but I even started to doubt myself, thinking, oh, you know, maybe I did stuff up somewhere. Anyway, I ran with my instincts. I knew what the property was worth. I lodged a development application. So, I got in and did a structural renovation. You can see, so you can see it was a pretty small house, right? Very small, only 70 square metres. So I took this in from a 70 square metre house to a 170 square metre house, okay? So I did an alteration addition of an additional 100 square metres. Um, these are some of the shots post-renovation. So this is just like of the living room. What do you think of this? Nice. Do you know what? I don't create these big architectural masterpieces. What I'm very good at doing is just creating basic homes, basic designer living. And how I style, what I do to create the illusion is through property styling. You may not realise it right now, but what you're attracted to is the furniture, the styling in that property, not the house. Take away the furniture that is still a very plain house, okay? So don't think you have to create these big phenomenal things, you don't. So I got in, now you can see there, now see how I haven't built a McMansion? You know, I retained the fabric to the front of the house. So I had to, you know, put new um, roof and stuff like that, new cladding. So I did all of that. But see how the, the extension to the rear is just very minimal? So I bought the property for 720000 paid 170000 too much. Crazy me. Got in, did the structural renovation. Now, I did this renovation in four months. I was actually pregnant at the stage at the same time as well, on site. Um, in fact, I was actually on the site the day I had the baby. <laughs> but, um, and so I, I paid, the total project costs were 360000 Again, all money from the bank via a construction loan, okay? And I actually kept this property. Now, I'd got to the stage where I got enough cash flow from, from behind me where I could start picking and choosing which properties I wanted to keep and which ones I wanted to flip for a profit. Now, at the end of the day, guys, you have two strategies. You can either do buy, renovate and sell, which is a property flippers, a property traders, or you can buy, renovate and rent. The best strategy, without a doubt, is the buy, renovate and rent because what you do is you double dip. When you buy, renovate and sell, you just take a, you're only making a lump sum cash profit and that's no problem with that, right? But when you buy, if you have the ability to hold on to the properties, what you do by buy, renovating and renting, you add immediate value through the renovation, but then you're also holding it for long term, so you get long term capital growth as well. Can you see how you're getting two things, not one? So until you evolve to that level where you've got enough cash flow behind, you should definitely move to the buy, renovate. So I'd move to this strategy, the buy, renovate and rent. So needless to say, I got the bank out to revalue the property so I could get my money out and tip it into my next deal. And that property was revalued at 1.65 million. I made a profit margin of over half a million dollars, 570,000. Now tell me, Who's laughing at who now, right? So, needless to say, I guess the point, the moral of that very long story is that people will always try and pull you down. You might go home this afternoon and say to your husband, your wife, your brother, your sister, or you might go to work on Monday and say, I went and saw this crazy chick talk about renovating on the weekend. She sort of got me interested. Maybe I'm thinking about doing renovating. And you know what they're going to say? Renovating? Why would you bother? out in the dirt and dust all day, trades are going to rip you off, they're going to sting your variation, they're going to steal your car, whatever it may be, right? They'll tell you all sorts of things. They're myths, okay? So the reason why those things exist. So once you have the proper system, the proper knowledge, the proper tools, the proper system, then you're going to be in a much better position to actually go and truly make a profit margin from these deals. Okay, the third phase is the produce phase, and this is actually now the fun bit. When you do all the work yourself, and you may be able to vouch for this, but doing it at the moment, 
The problem is, A, when you do all the work yourself, you become so physically exhausted, it's not funny. You go home at five o'clock in the afternoon, you become a nana. You're going to bed at 5.30 in the afternoon because you're so physically exhausted, so physically wrecked from killing yourself on sight by physically doing all of this work. So needless to say, you don't have a social life. You become a hermit. Your friends say, where's Cherie? She's vanished from the face of the earth. It's because you're in bed. You're, you're, you're wrecked. So when you're so physically exhausted, you will start to hate renovating. Do you know anybody that has been the DIY and said, oh, renovating's consumed my life. Do you know anybody like that? If I'd been there, that's what you don't want to be doing. Now, also, when you're doing the, work, the DIY, you're doing the painting, the tiling, the landscaping, whatever it may be, it is impossible for you to be good at every single thing. Would you agree with that? You might be able to be good at painting, but I guarantee you probably won't be good at tiling or landscaping or paving paint the driveway. So what happens is when you're the DIYer, the quality control level slips on your property. Have you ever seen any properties that, have, that, have been, that you can tell at a DIY job? They sit on the market forever. So you don't want that. Also, when you're doing all the work yourself, your six-week renovation suddenly turns into what? Six months, okay? There's no way you can do everything in a day, okay? So the, lo the lead times push out, and what happens is, therefore, your holding costs increase. So am I making my point very clear? Don't ever be the DIYer. Where your time is best spent is not up on a ladder painting. Your time is best spent organizing five quotes for everything that you need, organizing, briefing your tradies properly, following up you know, a few days before they're due to start work, saying, hi, Tony, you're going to be just checking that you're going to be on site on Tuesday. Your time is best basically getting on the phone to the material suppliers and saying, look, I've been quoted $600 for that cooktop. Can you do a better price for me? And then shopping the, shop, you know, shopping the suppliers. Is that where you're best spending your time? Absolutely. And, and you know, professional renovators aren't the DIYs. That's a fact. Okay, so what you're really doing as a project manager, as a professional renovator, you're not doing the work, you're the delegator. All you're doing is delegating the work to your experts. Your experts are your builder, your draftsman, your interior designer, your tradies, carpenter, bricklayer, whatever. You don't have to know how a brick wall comes together. You ring up a bricklayer and say, I need to build a retaining wall here. You don't need to know that, you know, this block locks into that and you've got to put cement in. You don't need to know that, okay? So you're engaging your tradies. You just tell them what needs to be done. They go about it. The problem is, is that a lot of people treat tradies like docile moron, morons. That's a reality, okay? So you've got to give them a lot of professional credit. Now, you've got to love your tradies. When your tradies love you, they will go above and beyond the call of duty. Do we have any tradies in the audience? Okay, beautiful. Can I ask what sort of trader you are? Well, I'm a builder, but yes. I'm a carpenter. A carpenter, great. And so what was the other hand? Was there another hand somewhere? Um, okay, beautiful. All right, so I'll maybe do a little bit of a test on you. Now, one of the ways that I get my tradies, very simple way that I get tradies to love me, is that as part of my site establishment, what I do is I go in, so before I start the site, I find the closest cafe to my site. I go in and negotiate a bulk rate on coffees, cappuccinos, hot chocolates and teas. So I go to the owner and say, look, I'm about to start a big structural renovation. I have anywhere between 20 to 40 tradies on site every single day. I'm going to be ordering a lot of coffees. So instead of paying, say, $4 for a cup of coffee, can I negotiate? negotiate a bulk rate, can I pay, say, $2 a cup of coffee? And I also negotiate, if possible, not, I haven't always been able to achieve this, but I say, is it possible that somebody from your cafe, because I can't get off site, can somebody deliver those coffees on site every single morning around 7.30? So, you know, in a lot of times I've been able to negotiate that. So needless to say, every morning, you know, 7.30, sometimes, you know, thereabouts or a little bit later, you know, coffees get delivered on my site. So what I do is when a tradie starts work on my site, the first thing I'll say, let's say Tony the brick layer, I'll say, Tony, I'm going to buy you a coffee. What do you drink? Cappuccino? How many sugars do you have? White? Two sugars? No sugars? Whatever it may be. I write that in my construction site diary. So needless to say, when Tony's on site the next morning, I don't have to go back to him and say, Tony, what, what was it that you actually drank? So what I do is coffees, you know, six, seven, like a tower of coffees get delivered on site and I go around and I, I always make sure I physically give the coffee to every single tradie. Now if I'm feeling particularly generous, they'll get a cake, all right? Depends on my mood. If I'm in a good mood, they'll get a cake like a finger bun or whatever. Um, or sometimes you know, I'll even buy bacon and egg rolls for the tradies and we just have that together. We'll sit, you know, if I've got a smaller team on site, I'll go and buy, you know, if there's only like five people on site that day, I'll go and buy them a bacon and egg roll, whatever. So 
Don't underestimate the power of a coffee cup, okay? In fact, one lady attended one of the seminars like this, and um, she ended up doing my workshop, she said, and then she came back and watched me again, and she said, that one tip you gave me about the trading, she was actually doing a renovation right at that very point in time. She goes, I took that one tip away from you. She goes, whoa, what a difference I noticed in the way they treated me. So, like, again... A very simple thing, not hard, but most people don't think to do that. Can I just ask, um, sorry, the two biddles. I mean, are you, you're probably, I mean, your buildings are probably a bit different, but well, do you do this sort of stuff on your site? Yeah, absolutely, part of your site amenities. Okay, now know what you're going to do tomorrow. <laughs> okay, so um, normally I have lots of tradies in, my, in the audiences, and this, we've got a very small group here today. But, um, you know, I normally get lots of tradies, and as they say, nobody ever does that. And so I've become the favourite client of literally hundreds of tradies because I show them that I care. And you know what? They can see on site that Cherie, yeah, Cherie, is somewhat a little bit tough. She knows what she wants, yeah? She's not running a circus here. She's doing this in a business-like fashion. So, yeah, she can be a little bit tough when need be. But you know what? Cherie's also a very sweet girl who generally cares about people. So not hard things that you can implement, very easy things to implement that will really get tradies to, to like you. I also do other small tokens of appreciation. So, for example, if Tony the bricklayer, you know, built the walls, he did them, if he basically did his job on time, to the quality standard. Basically, if he does everything that he promised he would do, at the end of the job, I go and buy them a $20 lotto ticket. So I'll go up to him at the end of the job and say, Tony, you did a fantastic job. That wall looks so good. You know, I don't know why you know, they didn't do it themselves before the previous owners. So I say, Tony, I really appreciate what you've done. Look, I just actually bought you a little present. It's just something small. It's not much. It's only just a $20 lotto ticket. But, Tony, I hope you win lotto so you never have to work again for anybody else but me. All right? I always make sure I put that. You want to keep your good tradies, all right? So, you know, people just don't do this. So needless to say, in my feasibility with my structural renovations, I always allocate about $5,000 to basically the sundries and the small tokens of appreciations. And it's one reason. I have traders ringing me all the time saying, Cherie, Cherie, when's your next project starting? Do you think they like working on my site? Absolutely. So I'm also very big at praising why? Wow. So, Tony, you did a fantastic job. That looks awesome. So if I'm walking through and the cement render has just rendered the facade of a house, I'll walk around the site and I'll just go, Rocco, oh my goodness, that looks fantastic. I will, I'm very big on this. Why is it that in a corporate office we're praise, 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 and then why is it that on a construction site there's nothing? Why? So little things that you can do to really get people on your site. Because I tell you what, when the tradies like you, they will help you. If you've got, if you don't, if you lack knowledge on how things come together, when you have a good relation to them, you can go up to them and say, "Tony, I have absolutely no idea what I'm doing here. Tell me, what should I be doing here?" And they won't laugh at you and think you're an idiot. Okay? They will help you. Say, "You need to do this, this, do this, order that, whatever." So that's the stage that you need to get to. Okay, I just want to show you too why renovation horror stories exist. When I start my site. Basically, every tradesperson that starts, they get this mail to them before they actually start work, if time allows, okay? So, what is this? Well, it's about six or seven of my templates, of my 144 templates, and growing by the week. Um, but what is this? I'll quickly go through this with you. The first template is a contract award. It basically says, congratulations, you got the job. You're stuck with me now. So, it's, it's, it's basically saying, you know, confirming they've actually got the job. Now, one of the documents here is called what's called a scope of works document. Now, I have this for every single trade. It's part of my system. There's a scope of works document for every single trade. So, I think it's about 40 or 40 or 45 of these in my system. I'll quickly go through with you. What we're trying, remember what I'm saying here is that we're trying to now take you out of amateur hobbyist investor, and we're now trying to make you into a professional property investor. So, this scope of work document clearly sets out what happens on your site. So, it says here the nature of our business. My business relies on buying, acquiring, and selling properties for a profit. I'm already, I'm already saying my business is about flipping properties for a profit, okay? I'm not doing it just for love. Um, I pretty much say that expect a lot of tradespeople. We will have multiple tradespeople working on site every day. Please expect this on our site. 
um, you know, our objective is to get in and out of the projects as quickly as possible without compromising the quality at all on the projects. So can you see how I'm setting the scene? Okay, variations. If you're going to have a variation, please sign the attached variation form. You sign it, I sign it before the work starts so we don't have any arguments post-work. Building codes and standard. Occupational health and site safety. This drug, my sites are a drug and alcohol-free zone. Don't underestimate, particularly young ones, okay? I actually had um, an incident last year. One of my, I got two, had two labourers on one of my sites and um, one of my labourers, and they're only like, you know, 19, 20-year-olds, one of my labourers come up to me and said, Cherie, um, Matthew's actually stoned today. Just thought I'd let you know. And I went, what? Because I don't take drugs, I had absolutely no idea. I just thought Matthew was pretty happy that day. Um, anyway... He got ordered off site straight away. I put him in a taxi and he got taken home, okay? So, you know, you just sometimes don't, don't, make, don't make assumptions with anything on your properties. You know, get it documented. Contractor insurances. You must give me a photocopy of your contractor's insurance policy, your public liability and your workers' compensation and your licence card before you start work on site. Do you know a lot of tradies don't have insurance? They say they've got insurance... So people ask the question, but they don't actually follow through the next step and actually get a copy of it. So needless to say, I've said to lots of tradies, I've seen it so many times over the last 10 years, where I've said, have you got insurance? Yes. And they say, okay, I need a copy of that insurance before you start work. And they go, oh, oh, oh. actually, I just found out it actually expired like two months ago. I didn't even realise. Um, you know, some contractors even copy other tradies' contractor numbers from the local paper. So don't underestimate little tricks and things that happen out there. Professionalism, conduct, you know, please respect your neighbor, please respect the neighbors. Don't, you know, don't leave tools or your your stuff on the neighbor's front lawn. Like, you know, be respectful of our neighbors. Um, you know, there's a mini skip on site. You know, we don't have magical fairies working on our site to pick after you. So please pick up after yourself and put any waste in the mini skip bin that's located on site. Because if you don't manage that, you can basically be a DIYer just cleaning up your tradies' mess every day. So you've just got to spell every single, single thing out. You know, the construction project plan. If you're going to be late in the construction project, please let me know sooner rather than later so I can notify everybody else down the chain. Payment of invoices. Please submit your invoice to me by 3 p.m. Friday afternoon. The money will be direct debited over the weekend via your bank account. So instead of the tradies coming up to me and having the uncomfortable question, oh, Cherie, um, do you think you could pay me this invoice cash or, you know, those sorts of questions that you get asked all the time? It stops all those unfortunate... Un what it does, this scope of works document actually just stops out unnecessary um, questions or having to repeat yourself 50 million times. There's also a, a, a section at the back here which, which basically says, what are the specific tasks that they're being hired to do? Now, for example, if I wanted to get a house painted, what I would do here is... And these are all editable, so you can type into them. What I would do here is I'd put... Sand walls, fill and patch walls, sanding where required. One coat of undercoat, two coats of paint. That's it, right? Let's not complicate things, okay? So what you do is that if you're organising, so you, my, I recommend that you always organise a minimum three to five quotes is your aim for everything that you need because that's the only way of how you're going to truly benchmark what the true cost of something is. So when you get your five tradies out to quote on the cement rendering for a house, for example, they all get this document. Okay, So they get this document before they actually come out as part of their quoting process. Now, I guarantee if you have this, this document, when you get the quotes back, you're going, to be, you're going to be getting quotes that are pretty much apples for apples, not apples for oranges. Because you may get a painter out and they'll say okay, I want to paint the house, they'll work on, say, one painter will work on a pure undercoat, another one will work on two coats of paint, so three layers there. You might get another painter who will come out who will tint the undercoat, tint it to the same paint colour, and then only put one coat on top, and technically it's only two coats. So that's where you can get some variations in the quotes. Does that make sense? Okay, so what it does, it stops out all those. So instead of you being on site and saying, hey, I only saw you put two coats of paint on, they'll say... No, I've got two coats of paint instead of three. Instead of saying, no, I paid for three. And they're going, no, you've actually got two coats. Can you see what I mean? So these documents stop all of that during the course of construction. So they get that. They get a couple of other templates. 
all the contact details of the tradies and the consultants, separate one for all the consultants. I call the consultants the suits, like your architect, your surveyor, um, interior designer, if you've got an interior designer. Basically, the hydraulic engineer, structural engineer, they're all your suits, and then your tradies are your tradies, your, your plumbers, carpenters, concreters, whatever they may be. Now, everybody gets a copy of the trade team working on the project. Why on earth would tradies want this? Yeah, so when Cherie is at her full-time marketing job at L'Oreal and the plumber is down the corner of the back of the, back of the yard and he's looking at the pit and he's looking at the hydraulic drawings and going, uh, that, don't that don't match, is he going to call Cherie or is he going to actually call the hydraulic engineer on this? So what it does, it actually ex it eliminates some of the backwards and forwards and you having to get involved on your projects. Obviously, the building contract, so you always want to make sure you've got a signed legal contract. There's the contract variation form. So again, if there's going to be a variation, they, they sign it. You sign it before the work starts finish. And the last thing they get, and this is a very important document, this is the project plan. So what it is, it's the, basically the schedule of works, the construction project plan for the whole project. And it basically lists down everything that needs to be done. What I do is I highlight the tradies' name in, with a yellow highlighter so they clearly can see what they are being employed to do. Tony, the bricklayer, can see that if he doesn't turn up on Monday, the 1st of April, if he doesn't turn up on that day, that's actually going to impact the plumber coming in on Tuesday, the 2nd of April. So when they have these documents, they make themselves more accountable. Now, the reality is, when you're going through the quoting process and you give people some of these scope of works documents, the reality is some of the tradies are going to go, she kidding or what? They're going to say, too hard, taskmaster. They're not even going to bother submitting a quote. Would you rather get rid of a tradie at that point or would you rather get rid of them, have an issue three quarters of the way through the project? These are the why renovation horror stories exist. It's because people's own fault because this is not hard, is it? Like This is just communication, but unfortunately just it's something to do with you know, the fact that it's a construction site. People feel they don't have a need they feel the need to take shortcuts and not having to brief and communicate to people properly. It's, you know, like I said, I'm not the smartest cookie in the box. Just for me, this is very basic stuff, common sense stuff that people don't have the common sense to actually implement. Okay, and the last part of the process. Okay, now this is once you've actually gone through the, um, the renovation process, yes, you may have some ups and downs, I guarantee you, in your renovation, in your first project. Yes, you're going to have a few ups and downs. My jobs will be to minimise the jobs with what you learn in my workshop. But, you know, at the end of the day, it is a fun process and I guarantee that all of you will love the process. Now, when it comes to, to the actual profit phase, which is now about reselling your property, let's assume you want to resell, there are things that you can do to actually help you sell the property yourself. Now, I don't mean you selling the property yourself, I mean to assist the, the real estate agent. I'm going to show you again another example, just one of the many little ways that I can basically assist the real estate agent. You've got to let buyers recognise value. Now, do you think, let's say I'm going to put my renovated house on the market, it's sparkling, it's beautiful. Do you think for everybody that comes through on that very first open for inspection, do you think the real estate agent's going to come through and say, Joe and Lucy, this house has underfloor heating and we have solid stone designer bath through here and we have self-breaking drawers on the, cabinet, on the kitchen cabinets here. Do you think the real estate agent's going to be doing that? No chance, right? They just don't forget. Nobody knows your project as good as you. You've been there. You've been renovating it for the last six years. You know every nook and cranny of the property. So one way that I assist the real estate agents to actually help sell my property when I'm not there, because at the end of the day, I'm not there during the open for inspections. I'm putting that control into somebody else's hand. One way that I do that is that I've created these templates. I have about 40 of these in my system, um, one for every room. So there's ones for kitchens, bathrooms, bedrooms, laundry st you know, studies, outdoor entertaining areas. So what I do is I have these little templates where all you have to do, like these are all standard, and you just come in and you type over the text, like you, you basically insert your own text there. And what they do is they list every single feature and benefit on a room-by-room -room basis. So I'll just read out some of these, for example. Actually, I'll do the bathroom. So the bathroom on here, it says underfloor heating. Is Joe and Lucy, unless the agent tells them, is Joe and Lucy going to know that there's underfloor heating in the bath? No, because they can't see it. They're not going to know if there's insulation, if all the walls are fully insulated. They don't see it. So I'll come through and go underfloor heating. So what they do is, well, sorry, what I do is I print these, sorry, I list all the features and benefits, I'll backtrack. I list all the features and benefits. I then take them to Officeworks and I laminate them. 
In, when I first started doing this in my early days, I didn't laminate them. And what happens is you stick them on the wall and the corners start turning out. They look very, very scruffy. So you laminate them. You put some double-sided tape on the back of them. And what I do is I stick it under the light switch in every single room. So it's in the same place in every single room, stuck neatly to the wall. Buyers will come through your property and they'll go, what's that? What's that on the wall? So they'll walk over to the light switch and they'll go, oh, this, this bathroom has underfloor heating, Joe. All oh, right. Oh, self-breaking drawers. Ooh, what's that? So what do you think they're going to do? They're going to walk over to the cabinet and they're going to go, and you know, the, the doors go back on and they go, oh, look at that. And so then they'll, <laughs> and then they'll go through and they'll go, oh, solid stone designer bar, designer tapware from Italy. So half the time you just tell whatever in these things. Like, you can't lie, but, you know, if somebody says a designer tap, you know, really ramp it up. So I make it sound like it's really good. So, you know, I do this on a room by room basis. So needless to say, they'll sit on that first room. They'll then, off they'll trot, they'll trot into the next room, the kitchen. They'll go, they'll see the same card again, but a different one applicable to that room. And they'll start reading. By the time they get to their third room, guess what they're now doing? They're going to look for the card. So this is just one way that I basically take things into my own hands not take the job away from the real estate agent, but I assist the real estate agent without even being there. Do most people do these little things? Is this creative? Absolutely. Very simple. Like I said, everything in my system is very simple, but just practical stuff that most people don't have any, any um, idea to do. Okay. Property styling. Now, when you renovate a house, regardless of whether it's property investment, development, or renovation, you can never sell your house without property styling. To do this is real estate suicide. Do you know what property styling is? For those of you that don't know, property styling is just rental furniture. So I'm going to show you a couple of things. Have a look at this property here. Now, let's say this house comes on the market. It's a nice house, right? You can clearly see it's a nice modern whatever it is. But what's, what's, what's the problem here? It's empty. What? What else? It doesn't show anybody what it's going to be. It doesn't a picture. Exactly. You, just, you hit it on the head. It doesn't show anybody what this property can be. A lot of people can't visualise things. They need assistance. There's, you know, there's that left brain, right brain visual. Some people are text orientated, some are visual. And so you have to create it. You have to create, set the scenario of what something can be. And the way that you do that is through property styling. So as I said, even if you don't want to be a renovator, even if you're just going to be selling your own home at some point in time, don't ever sell it without property styling. Yes, Property styling is expensive, but there are lots of ways, and I, I certainly teach these in my workshop, lots of ways that you can drive your property styling costs down if you're smart and you know how. So this property, the problem here is that it doesn't, you know, it doesn't arouse any emotion, does it? What about now? Can you see? Simple rental furniture. So the property stylist, you can either get a property stylist or interior designers do all of this. They just have an ability to put the blanket the right way and put the fluffy cushion exactly the right way. They just have this ability to create something from a very ordinary space. So it's, just, it's an illusion. It's an illusion. And this is why you don't need to create architectural masterpieces because where you do spend the money is in the stuff like the property styling. Here's another room. You know, okay room. You sort of walk into this property during the open for inspection and go, yeah, yeah, okay, yeah. Not really going to go crazy over this one. But what about now? People come in and go, oh, I really like this. They don't realise they're looking at the furniture. In fact, you know what? On my very first property, I got the property styled. Um, and as soon as this contract was signed, the property styling got picked up because you're paying for it every day. And when the buyers came to do the final settlement, you know, the day on the settlement, the morning of the settlement, they come and do their final check just to make sure you haven't stolen the cooktop and the lights and everything. They come through the house, they opened the door and they went, oh, it actually doesn't look as good anymore. And it's because the property styling had gone. So, you know, once you know how, very easy. Okay, here's another example. So have I convinced you about property styling? Okay. All right, time your sale. Do you know there's good times to sell a property and bad times? Okay. What's the worst time to ever sell your property? December, January. It's a good time to buy them. Absolutely. That's exactly right. So the, best, the worst time to sell your house is literally from mid-November mid to that January period. If you want to get 
if, if any of you want to get a bargain, I always make sure I'm in the marketplace during those periods because I always get property under value. I truly believe that's the only time you can really get property under value is at that Christmas time because the reality is people aren't in house hunting mode in November to January. They're in Christmas shopping mode. They're thinking about the money that they need for Christmas and they're also in holiday mode as well. Most people go away during those periods. So, you know, everybody says sell your house in spring, right? Would you agree with that? It's not necessarily true. You've got to just, with property, you have to determine what's fact from fiction. Yeah, you have to determine what's fact from fiction. What happens in spring, everybody puts their house on the market, so suddenly you shift the control position from the, from the vendor to the buyers. When there's a lot of property on the market, buyers have the advantage because they say, well, you know what, if, I don't, if, if this offer gets accepted, I'm going to take this one over here or I'm going to accept an offer on both, whoever takes the offer. So the, the control goes to the buyer. In winter, what happens, everybody holds out for spring, so there's less properties on the market in winter but the same amount of buyers. So there's therefore short supply in winter. So you can now see, like, we're all trained and we sort of, we get all these myths about property that we're taught in the media. It's the same way the media says the property market is really bad at the moment. It makes me laugh. I go, there's 2,750 property markets, there's 2,750 suburbs in Australia. Are you saying that every single suburb is the same? So you've got to determine fact from fiction. There's a lot of, a lot of myths out there. All right, who wants to know the two ways to get a start in property? Okay, all right. First one is called earn a spotter's fee. Has anybody ever heard this before? Spotter's fee? Sometimes it's called a site scout fee. So what you do is this. I'll just go through the steps first and I'll come back to it. What you do is you find a property either unrenovated or renovated, or even just a passive property investment or a development, so it can be anything, any type of property. What you do is you take it, you produce an investment summary, so I'll show you that in a second, okay? You take it to a willing buyer. If somebody buys it, you get paid a spotter's fee. That is the core steps, okay? And let me talk about this. So what it is, with the spotter's fee, would you agree there's a lot of lazy people out there these days? Would you agree? Absolutely. I'm a classic example, I'm not lazy, but I'm very time poor these days. Obviously, I'm a professional renovator by day, I you know, public speak all over the country every week. I also literally have a full-time job with my media commitments with Foxtel these days, so I'm extreme, and I have a daughter, right? I'm extremely time poor. Just for me to even watch a movie is a luxury. And so, my problem my, these days is that I don't have time, I'm constantly looking for deals and I don't have time to be going through every Saturday morning looking for deals, okay? So I have students, my graduates, I pretty much say anybody that finds me a deal, I will pay them a site scout fee. So what it is, is that you can go and find a property either unrenovated or renovated. As I said, it can be even just a passive property investment because a lot of people are too lazy to attend the open for inspections every single week. They're too lazy to become an expert and truly know what property values are. Would you agree with that? Okay. And lazy, maybe not just for the sake of being lazy, just lazy maybe just because they're time poor. Or they just don't have the confidence in themselves to be able to do that. So... You can either do this, now you can do this for properties that are off market. Off market are properties that haven't been publicly advertised. So for example, if your neighbour says to you, you know, you're chatting to your neighbour at the fence and she says, hey, sure, I'm thinking about selling my house. Go for the killer, right? That's an off market transaction. You can get a higher spotter's fee for off market transactions. But you can also do spotter's fees for properties that are on the market as well. I have one student here in Sydney who has earned a phenomenal amount of money by doing spotter's fees. And they've all been properties that are on the market. So she's just basically going, like saying, you know, going to somebody and saying, look, this property's on the market. I've done the due diligence, this, this, you know, the due diligence report. So once you find a property that a potential deal, what what you need to do is you need to produce this template. Now, you're looking at this thinking, whoa, that's one serious report, right? But do you know what? It's just all the other templates stuck together from the system. So just the checklist, okay? So what you can do is, the reality is this will probably take you half a day to a day to modify, to tweak to your own individual suburbs, because you've got to remember, your, these sections, you only have to do them once, and then you're, you're just bringing in individual property details into these reports. So what it is, it's just a report that pretty much says everything about the property. There's a, a you know, the first section is property fact sheet, so, you know, the address, the land size, the internal house, the zoning, all that sort of property stuff. The second section is the suburb due diligence, very similar to the finance proposal. Third section, property due diligence. And the fourth section is the project viability. Now, Brad, if I can use you as, as an example again, I'm not picking on you today, sorry. But let's say, sorry, what do you do for a living, can I ask? 
Okay, well, that sounds good. Um, so, what I like, for example, if you had some money to spend, let's say if you were looking for an investment property and let's say you were with your work, you were tied up weekends or whatever it may be, you're just time poor, would you like it if I came? So, you're in the market to buy something, okay? Would you like it if I came up to you and said, Brad, I've actually found this property. It, look, that then it's a property that's on the market at the moment. They're looking for a purchase price of around five hundred thousand. I've identified everything you can do to this property. This is definitely a cosmetic renovation deal. You can get in and do a six-week cosmetic renovation. It's showing a fifty-five thousand dollar profit margin. I've actually done the whole due diligence report for you. I'm going to leave this with you overnight. If you decide to buy the property, I'm just asking a spotter's fee of three thousand dollars. If you go ahead and buy that deal, are you interested, Brad? Okay, and that is it, all right? That is it. So it's an honesty system, okay? So if Brad was, for example, to go and buy that property, it is a, it's a goodwill gesture. There is actually no legal contract required for that. So again, if Brad was to do something wrong with me, thank you, I'm sure you'd love to keep that, right? <laughs> um, so if Brad was to go and buy that property, when Brad signs the contract, when he exchanges the property, that spotter's fee is paid to me then. But if Brad was to jip me out of that and go, I'm sorry, I bought the property, but that, then I know I'm, no, I'm never going to be doing business with Brad again. So just be careful, be conscious who you take that to. Just, you want to be doing business with people who've got good ethics as well, okay? But very much an honesty. And that, so that's literally it. Is that hard? So what I say to people is, if you've got absolutely no money, one way you can get a start in renovating is do a spotter's fee. I actually had one student that earned $50,000 in one week from doing a couple of spotter's fees where she got paid 15000 The more profit margin in a deal, the higher the spotter's fee. So she was getting fifteen dollars to $20,000 for each spotter's fee with structural reno opportunities, probably around the $1 million mark that was showing about a $250,000 profit margin. She was getting fifteen, twenty. dollars She even got $25,000 for one once. So, and what, what she's doing is now she's selling them the deals and she's also going and project managing them for them. So she's getting further cuts. So she's made really great money. All right, so spotter's fee. This is one of my very early projects. I did a spotter's fee by fluke. I didn't realise I was doing it, but I did it by fluke when I first started in renovating. I agreed to buy these two semis in Cameron Street, Balmain. Now, it was one owner, two titles, and what I, I negotiated a deal of 960000 purchase price. I rang up a builder and said, I'm actually going to take this one. Do you want to take this one? It's got some upside for you in that you can put a development application through to put a second story on the property. So he actually went and bought that. He goes, yep, I'll take the other one. So when I agreed that deal, 960 with the agent, I said, I'm going to put the contract for one in one name. I'm going to put the contract in the name for the other one. So I didn't, I didn't have to say to her, I'm, there's actually going to be two parties. I'm going to go and try and offload the other one because that would have hampered the negotiations. So I immediately got on the phone and literally he signed that contract. Went and had a look at it straight away. Deal was done. I made $40,000 profit margin in one phone call. Looking back, that was a really good spotter's fee. Like I probably should have only got like five or 10000 for that. So that one I just got lucky on. But that's as simple as what it can be. So if, how successful you are in spotter's fees, if you don't mind talking to people and putting yourself a little bit out there and start networking with people, then you, know, you can definitely do this. So what I say is if you've got no money, do a couple of spotter's fees, make these lump sum cash margins and then you'll, um, cash profits, and then you'll have enough to tip you into your first deal if that's what you want to do. Okay, here's another great strategy. Trade your time and skills for a profit share. So this is rich, literally like a project management fee, okay? So sometimes you can go and do a renovation where you don't have to contribute any money. You just go in and you act as the project manager, okay? So what you can do now, you've got to be careful because some states in Australia, you can, in fact, you can do this in every state of Australia. In some states like Queensland, for example, if you're going to project manage a cosmetic or structural, you may have to involve a builder as well. So it's about you knowing, and I certainly teach this in my workshop. So what you do with this one is this. You find a debt partner or somebody that has an existing property that needs renovating. A lot of people don't have the inc inclination to renovate purely because they don't know how to renovate and they get scared from all these renovation horror stories. So find somebody that's got a property or find somebody that's actually got some money to buy a property. So what they become is they become the debt partner, okay? You do a joint venture together or you do a project management fee together, arrangement together, where you're basically going in and you're renovating for them. What, what am I contributing? As the professional renovator, what am I contributing? Knowledge. My knowledge and my skills, okay? One person, one party is contributing the money. 
One person is contributing their time, their skill, their intellectual property knowledge. And what you do is whatever profit, whatever incremental profit you add to the property, you take a profit share. So for example, so I'll just I'll flick those steps up for you so I can just got, have time to write that down. So what you do is this. You go into a property, so one person's going to fund it and you contribute the time and skill. Now what I did with this one, I'll just give you some time to write that down. I know a lot of you are writing that down, so I won't flick across to the side. I just did this project in Pimble last year where I had a phone call from a guy who said, Shri, I know you renovate houses. He was an executive, he did a lot of travel overseas, so he just didn't have any time. He, he just didn't want to renovate. He was just, you know, he valued, I guess he valued his, his spare time more. And so um, he said to me, can you actually renovate this house for me? I don't normally do that for people. I normally only do my, my own projects, but I agreed to do it in this instance. Now, it was a seven-month project. What we did is, so he was the debt partner. He had the existing property. He funded the renovation in its entirety. So is there anybody still writing that down so I can flick to the next slide? Okay, good. All right, so this is the property here. The value of value the property at 1.4 million. Now the total renovation cost, the total project cost was 780,000. He funded that; it's an entirety. Okay, I did not contribute one dollar of my own money to this project. I got in and did the seven-month renovation, so the total cost of the project was 2.18 million. The property was revalued by the same valuer that originally valued it at $3.1 million. So through my time, my skill, my intellectual property knowledge as a property professional, I added 920000 incremental value to that property and I got a 50% slice of that, which was 460000 as a project management fee. Now, what percentage you get depends on who's contributing what to the relationship. If, for example, if I was contributing the time, the skill, and I was tipping some money in, well, then that's not a straight 50-50 split, okay? That might be 40-60, 40 to him, 60 to me. So how you work out the percentages is who's contributing what to the deal. Does that make sense? Okay, so just two very quick, very easy ways to get a start in renovating with no money. As I said, if you're willing to put in the effort, you can produce these results. So I think you would agree that with what I've taught you today, with these just very basic things, it comes down to having the right knowledge, having the right tools, and the right systems in place. Pretty much what's happened to me over the last... So is it okay if I talk to you about my workshops now? Okay. What pretty much happened to me is over the last 10, 11 years, and particularly because of my media commitments, people know I was the Balmain renovator. I can't tell you how many people have come up to me and said, Cherie, I would love to do what you do. Buy these old houses, get in, renovate them, sell them for a profit. I would love to do, love to do that. How do you do it? I get asked that all the time. Unfortunately, and we've shared two hours here this morning, I've only given you 1% of the 100%, okay? It's impossible to answer that question in five minutes. So needless to say, I've gone out for a lot of lunches, a lot of um, coffees with people over the years, you know, trying to help them get on their way. So what it really did is it sort of became the catalyst for me a couple of years ago, almost two years ago, that I started teaching people how to do this as a professional renovator. Now, make, make, make no mistake about it, I never set out to become a professional speaker on renovating. I was asked to do it, and uh, it actually went from there. The reality is I love what I do renovating, I truly do, but I also get quite a kick these days out of also teaching other people how to do it as well. So what I developed is a three-day workshop. It's called the Renovation Riches Workshop. Last year they were a two-day program. This year I've moved them into a three-day program simply because there was just so much information. It was even, even impossible to download it in two days. So what it pretty much is, my three-day workshop is purely focused on teaching you the eight steps of the renovation system. Now what it is, the eight steps are a logical sequence of events. So you start at number one and you work your way through the process. And this is how it basically goes through the whole, the whole sequence from the time that you start to the time you finish. Can you notice here, like step seven, there's a lot of stuff to be done before you even start swinging around a hammer on site, okay? And this is a problem. Everybody thinks renovating is about, they just think construction, construction, and it's not. It's truly what you do before you buy that's a big part of the equation as well. Regardless, and this is regardless, not just for renovating. Some of you in this room have no intention of renovating, okay? But if you're in, interested in property investing or developing, then the first six steps of this process apply to you, okay? So what I do is, in my workshops, um, as I said, they're a three-day program. They're about 33 hours over the three days, so they're quite an intensive workshop. And this is where I download my experience 
practical, nitty-gritty, tactical tasks that you must do on a day-in, day-out basis with your property projects. Would you agree today that I haven't given you, I mean, I have given you slightly high-level theory, but would you agree today I've given you some practical things that you can walk away and implement? Okay, that's what my workshop is about. I know a lot of you may have gone to seminars in the past and you go into these workshops and they may be at a high level and you walk out thinking, what did they just say? You know, where do I start? Okay, my workshop is not like that. In fact, one of the tools that I've developed is this step-by-step -step guide and this is what I call the recipe. So it pretty much says, you start at number A, you go tick, 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 I've done that. Once you've done everything in A, you progress to number B, okay? And this, this basically starts from, from the time you start at step number one and it just goes right through everything, the main things that you have to do. This is the recipe. I say to my students, like when we're doing our postgraduate calls every month, our, my graduate source pen, they say, which step are you at? Are you at number 5A? The next month when our team phones them and say, are you, whereabouts, I'm still stuck at number 8. Okay, why are you stuck at number 5A? What's, what's going on there? So we basically use this also a tracking to make sure you are progressing in the right way through your projects as well. So it is a true step-by-step -step system and it's literally foolproof. If you, if you do that, then it's going to be extremely hard for you not to come out with a profit margin at the end. Now my workshops have three base sessions, one on called the basics and this is where I talk in much more detail about the differences between cosmetic and structural renovations and the formulas, the mathematical equations behind um, property investing. And the second session is uh, where my personal accountant comes in and talks about how to set up your company business. Now the reality is, who owns property here in this room? Have any of you bought it in your personal name? Who's bought property in their personal name? Big mistake, okay? You're exposing yourself to lawsuits. Um, you're totally, when you buy property under your personal name, you are totally exposed. So what you need to do is you need to start buying your property under either a company name or a trust structure, okay? So I'm going to teach you how to, well, I don't personally, my account, because I'm not licensed to be able to give you that advice, but my personal account will teach you how to set your portfolio up so you minimise the risk of ever being sued and also, more importantly, how you can now start paying very minimal capital gains tax instead of 48 cents in the dollar when you're flipping your property within 12 months, okay? The third session is setting up your property business. Now you're going to, remember today I've said to you, we're now taking you out of amateur, hobbyist, mum and dad investor, and we're now putting you in a different category, which is professional property investor. I've actually gone and set up your property businesses for you. In fact, a lot of my templates on my disk are your new property business templates. So I've done all your organisational charts, your company, your business plans, your profiles, all those sort of things. I've done all your staff leave forms, um, performance review. All of that is already done, okay? So you can literally hit the ground running with this system and go into this very quickly. I've established my own business, Renovating for Profit, two years ago. And let, you tell, let me tell you, I've spent the last year creating the templates for the system, even for my own business. So I'll just give you a very quick head running start. Once we cover those very three base sessions, we are straight into step number one. So I teach you, in, for example, in step number one, we have 2,750 suburbs here in Australia. How do you get down to the magical three? What is that process? How on earth do you get down to that magical three suburbs to suit you? So I teach you how to do that because make no mistake about it, not every suburb is good for property investment or renovation, okay? So you need to know the certain profiles of suburbs to look for. There's things like lifestyle suburbs, heritage and conservation suburbs, domino suburbs, stepsister suburbs, gentrification suburbs. If I'm talking to you and sounding like I'm talking a foreign language, it's because you probably don't know enough about property investment right now. So I teach you all that whole process. I teach you how to become a suburb expert, how to do your proper professional property due diligence so you never buy a lemon again. I teach you how to analyse, work out whether or not you can actually make a profit margin from the property that you're looking at. That whole analyse the, the potential phase. You know, we talk about the hundred ways that you can add value to a property. So I go right through that. Step number five is an interesting phase. You know, I talk a lot about the banks, who does what. Um, my finance expert comes in and talks about this. I also do this. I also talk about the ways that you can actually take control of things like auctions, for example, so you can regain some of the power back. Um, how properties are sold, the different sale methods, auctions, private treaties for sale, private properties, all sorts of things. I'm just going to give you an example. Step number five, like, again, this is just one of the templates in my system. You might find this really handy. I have this, there's a, you know, even for me in the acquisition phase, and you can apply this even right now if you're buying a property right now. You know, instead of submitting, most people submit one offer. Would you agree with that? They say, I'll give you $500,000 for that property. 
I never do that. So what I do is I submit a range of offers. So I'm putting myself in a position where I'm competing against my own offers, not me competing against six other strangers out there. So what I do, for example, offer one is a base price. So it would be the lowest price with no conditions. Remember I spoke about those creative conditions like extended settlement, immediate access. The reality is if you ring Chris, the real estate agent, and say, Chris, I'd like to buy that property, but I want to pay minimal deposit, I want immediate access, and I want extended settlement, what do you think Chris is going to say to you? Go away. Too hard basket. But if you submit them on these templates that I've developed, where you have basically offer one with no conditions, offer two at a slightly higher price with some conditions, offer three at a slightly higher price again with more conditions, and offer four with a higher price with all the conditions, guess what price the vendor, when this gets submitted, which price, which offer is the offer going to go straight to? Offer four. They're going to automatically go to the higher price. They're going to go, yeah, oh, geez, I'm getting a premium for the property. I'm actually getting 10000 more than what I'm asking for. Oh, but I've got to give them a minimal deposit. Yeah, I can live with that. Extended settlement. Yeah, I can live with that. Immediate access. Oh, I'm not sure about that. Oh, maybe offer three. So what they do is they start picking and choosing which, one, which offers actually suit them. Again, do most people do this? No, okay? So there's lots of things you can do like that to get the deals across the line. Step number six is all about the council approval process. So how can you get it through, you know, your DAs through quickly? Step number seven is the renovation process. So this is where I talk about how to find your tradies, how to project manage them, how to get them working at peak performance, how to do your briefing, how to get quotes, how to analyse quotes, how to get your materials for cheap, like everything, anything, how you project manage your sites, the legal ramifications, Everything when it comes to the physical work on site, that's what I teach. And then obviously step number eight is the resale. So either renting your property for the maximum price or reselling. So can you see how it's a logical sequence of events? Okay. All right, this is pretty much, you're going to learn many things at the workshop if you decide to come. You're going to learn many, many things. Um, the high level things I'll quickly go through with you. I'm going to teach you how you can get started with no money. As I said, if you think money is the motivator, you're sorely mistaken, Okay. How to minimise, how to set yourself up so you minimise tax, okay? We want you paying minimal capital gains tax, not the maximum capital gains tax. How to select the right suburbs, so how you get down to that magic three, what are the suburb profiles that you need to look for to make sure you can go into these properties with confidence. How to do your suburb, your suburb due diligence, so what are the 40, I teach you the 40 ways to become an expert in your suburb. I teach you how to select the best properties in the suburb. Walking out from my workshop, you're going to become a fussy buyer. You're going to leave. You're going to be buying the diamonds and leave the duds for somebody else. Okay, so I'm going to teach you how you handpick, how you can identify the best properties that are targeted for property investment, renovation, or development. Okay, I'm going to teach you over 100 ways to add value to the property. I'm going to teach you how much to spend on your renovation. Do you know that most people go into their renovations and they have no idea what to spend? I'll give you a quick, I'll give you a quick example of one formula. Kitchen renovations. How much should you spend of your budget on your kitchen reno? Money. Oh, sorry, percent. Two percent. So if you buy a house for 500000 okay, 2%, so if you, buy, you base, always base it on the current value. So the purchase price, let's say it's a $500,000 house, your kitchen renovation budget is 2% equaling, uh, equaling $10,000, okay? That's $10,000 for everything. Cabinets, cooktops, ovens, range hoods, tiles, paint, $10,000. Any dollar that you spend over $10,000 means what? Less profit and you're overcapitalizing, okay? So there's lots of formulas that you need to be aware of. So... 2%. And that's all I'm giving you, all right? <laughs> nice try. It's sad day. I'm going to give that to you. All right, so lots of formulas. Same thing. 2% for kitchens, 2% for bathrooms. So lots of formulas. When you have these formulas, what it does, it makes you more conscious of your, where you're spending your money and it makes you more conscious that you need to stick to that budget. When you have a budget and you know that you've got 10000 for the kitchen, let me tell you, you do everything in your power to come. So you'll start negotiating harder. When you have no idea, it just goes kaput. All right, 
Adding wow factor to the property. So I'm going to teach you how to add the wow factor to your property so it sells super fast. I'm going to show you how to submit creative offers to make sure you can even get fir past first pace, get past the real estate agent. A lot of people get tripped up there because they don't know how to approach real estate agents. I'm going to teach you how to control an auction so it goes your way. Not always achievable, depends on how good the auctioneer is, but there's certainly things that you can do to try and basically get the power position back so that you've got a good chance of acquiring the property. There's a lot of, a lot of great unrenovated properties or deceased estates that always have to go to auction as well. I'm going to teach you fail safe ways to get finance every time. I'm going to teach you which banks are good for property investment and which aren't because as I said many times not all banks are equal. I'm going to teach you how to get the council like green fast. So if you're going to be doing a structural renovation, what is the process of doing a development application from start to finish? Who's involved? How do you get it through council very, very quickly? I'm going to teach you my foolproof system for getting the best from tradies, okay? I'm going to teach you how you can get tradies loving you the same way they love me as well, okay? Um, simple ways to make the property sell itself. And basically my workshop is everything that you're going to need from the time you walk out of the workshop to the time you finish the project, okay? What the workshop will do is it'll give you the confidence now to go into these properties and do them with confidence with a very high chance of being able to make a profit margin from it. Does that make sense? All right, now my workshops have become very popular. I am the only one in the country that is doing property workshops of this nature at a more advanced level. So even if you have absolutely no knowledge of renovating, we start at the absolute basic grassroots level. And what I'm teaching is I'm teaching, you know, basic to advanced strategies and a lot of creative strategies just to get you thinking outside of the square. Needless to say, last year was pretty much my first year of workshops. All of my workshops, I did eight workshops across the country last year. Just obviously I'm very limited with the amount of workshops I can do being a mother and a public speaker and a professional renovator and a, a media person these days. So all of my workshops last year sold out. Now what happened is a lot of people last year sat, they didn't enrol, they, they basically waited. And needless to say, last year, just for example, in my Sydney workshop, I had a waiting list of 93 people begging to get into the workshop. People saying, I'll sit on the floor, I'll do whatever, I just want to get a ticket in your workshop. You know, we cut the workshops off at a maximum of 200 people per workshop, okay? So if you are keen on registering, make sure you get in because I speak across the country every single week and these workshops can sell out literally overnight. Now, if for some reason you would like to attend the workshop and you can't do that date, certainly 30% of my students travel across the country, okay? So 30% um, of my students fly. So last year I did every single state. What I'm finding is this year I'm only doing Sydney, Melbourne, Brisbane. So my Adelaide and Perth students are flying um, into Sydney or Melbourne now. So the workshop training is generic right across the whole country. All right. Basically, what you get in your workshop is this. There's a couple of key things, and we'll break these down. You've got the knowledge component, okay? Because as we, we agree, I think you'll agree, is that knowledge is power. Do you believe that? Knowledge is power? They don't, why don't they teach you stuff in school? Like, it's, it's truly a crime. I just think it's a crime. So... There's the knowledge component, there's the tools, and obviously the system. So the knowledge component is obviously a ticket to my three-day life boot camp. So as I said, three intensive days where you get taught everything that you need to know to be able to basically walk out and um, become successful. Now, I take my events very seriously. I consider myself a very professional person. I take my events very seriously. I also recognise the cost of this workshop is a significant investment for a lot of you. I'm smart enough to realise that, okay? So therefore, I treat these events very seriously. What I can guarantee you is there's no humpha lumpha, there's no marching girls, there's no dancing on chairs or massaging people's back. I'm too busy for that. You're too busy for that. Feedback from my students is they don't want that. They just want to get the head down, get stuck into it, okay? So yes, my workshops are very serious. We do have a little bit of fun along the way, but mostly it's, it's about learning. I also hold my events at places like Sydney University. So, you know, I take, it, I take the learning very, very seriously. All right. Is it okay if I show you a quick two-minute video of just what some of my early students had to say? So these are some testimonials from my very first workshop that I did in Sydney. Needless to say, the system has evolved leaps and bounds since then, but just have a quick look. The, uh, the whole course was just so informative, um, it was enjoyable, you got enthralled. Oh, fantastic, it was absolutely fabulous, learnt lots, very inspiring. It's been so inspirational, you've shared so much knowledge beyond the point of duty and you've definitely changed my life. There's no way that we will not be a success after coming to this two-day seminar. This gives us new opportunities, new chances to do things that we've always wanted to do. And we're armed with the knowledge to do it properly now, which is the big thing about this weekend. And it was fun too. Genuine. Uh, the real deal and the information was incredibly practical. 
fantastic. It was really dynamic. It was a, it was an excellent session. I got an absolute huge amount out of it. I've got a, a lot to digest. I think I've got a, a high degree of confidence from it that if you stick to the rules, you can't really go too far wrong. It's a bit mind blowing at times. Um, it's opened my eyes a lot of stuff I didn't know. We're speechless. Fantastic weekend. It's just the best conference we've been to. So it's fantastic. Do it in an instant. Um, this is your future. Yep. Sign up and do it. Just the wealth of information that you'll take away from the weekend, unbelievable. Uh, lots of generosity of information and spirit, and now the rest is up to me, so I'm really happy. It's the best money I've spent. I'm sure I'm going to get it back hundredfold. What they've done within the courses, they've put into such a useful and practical, foolproof sort of method of going out and actually um, embracing and doing. Uh, yeah, the weekend was fantastic. I think if anyone's serious about property renovation, this is definitely the course to do. Uh, empowerment. It's empowered, empowered us to go forward and to make life whatever we want of it. It's been a, a really eye-opening experience because you know we always wanted to do this, but we didn't know how. And Cherise was just telling you that you take one step at a time and you can do it. And the fact you've got a, a, a pattern to follow, you can't go wrong. I'm really excited and I'm dying to get going. Thank you very much and good luck when you do yours. I would recommend it wholeheartedly, wouldn't have any hesitation in terms of saying to anybody, come on board, it will certainly give you plenty of bones to work with and move forward. Empower you in doing so. The value out of this course and is way beyond what you're actually paying for. If you're interested in maybe not renovating but even just property in general like it's just a great thing to get involved in like all this stuff that we've got well outweighs the like the cost of coming here. Um, it will answer all your questions um, look I found it fabulous what can I say? Worth, worth the money? Yeah right. absolutely. <laughs> Rock on. <laughs>What most students do in my workshop, we encourage you to bring an airport case because you need a case to basically cart all the stuff home with you that's given out to you over the course of the workshop. But pretty much the home study kit is your reference guide. It contains a copy of every single PowerPoint um, that is presented during the workshop. It also houses all the checklists and the templates and just anything else, um, architectural drawings. So I give you before and, exam you know, before and after floor plans of projects that I've done so you can go away and compare and, and get your head around the concept of renovating. So you get that as part of your package. Also, because the workshops are so information intensive, you get a DVD library of the workshop as well. So as you start to move through the progress, for example, if you're at step number five, where you're about to go and acquire a property that you've done all your due diligence on and it looks like it's a deal, you know, step number five, you whip out the step number five DVD, you refresh that in your head and away you go, you implement it again just to refresh your knowledge because it's impossible to, to maintain, remember every single thing that I'll say in the workshop. Just with the workshops, I do most of the workshops. 98% of the workshop is me. I have a couple of speakers that come in, but literally... I do the bulk of my... So this is not a workshop that is outsourced to lots of guest speakers, okay? I just want to make that very clear. So just so you know what you're getting on the knowledge part, it's the ticket to the three-day boot camp, a ticket that you can attend at any time of the year, okay? So just remember, don't... They'd sell out very, very quickly. I don't want anybody to be disappointed in that regard. You get the home study kit. You also get the DVD library. So that's the knowledge part of the, of the program. The second part of the program is that you need the tools, okay? Would you agree that you need tools, the right things, the right systems to be able to get past first base? So you get three property due diligence systems. Now, why would you need three due diligence systems? I'm going to see who was paying attention. Three suburbs, okay? So you have one property due diligence for each suburb, okay? So you can become an expert in the property values in your targets, each of your target suburbs. Okay, you get the renovation financial feasibility. This feasibility, you can buy this on my website right now for $895. This walks out the door. My feasibility has gone viral. So I've got developers all over the country who are buying my feasibility. It's just naturally gone viral. I didn't intend it, it just happened that way. So that, the beautiful thing about that is not, it's not an American software program. It's a very simple Excel spreadsheet that you plug in the costs applicable to your project. It's so simple, there's, no, it, there's even no instructions with it. So my students love that particular feasibility. Okay, you also get legal contracts. Now, to be able to do some of these deals like the joint venture agreements, 
um, you need legal contracts. About six months ago, I actually engaged my lawyer to produce a set of legal contracts that I could distribute to my, to my client, uh, to my graduates. And so what I did is, so there's a couple of heads of agreements, a couple of joint ventures, there's also some options agreement. So if any of you are interested in property development, these contracts are going to put you in very good standing to use. I paid $22,000 with my lawyer alone just for those five contracts. So pretty much the, the, the templates are there. You will still have to see a lawyer, okay? But instead of going and paying them five or $6,000, which you will straight off the bat for a joint venture agreement, you might only have to pay them a couple of hundred dollars or you know $500,000 to tweak the details you know, of your own specific property. So there's a big, huge cost, dif uh, cost difference there in having to recreate and start from scratch. Also, when you don't have these legal contracts, we know how long it would probably take through a lawyer to get something like this drawn up, right? Fair to say, a week or two would pass, you could lose the deal. So the beautiful thing is you've got them all on disk there, run with them, get the deal done, take the property off the market very quickly. Okay, you also get the construction project plans. Remember I showed you the document that I highlight with the yellow highlighter? I've created four construction project plans. So if you have no idea about construction, don't worry, I've done one for a straight cosmetic reno, one for a timber framed house, a brick finney and a double brick house. And that is the sequence of events in the construction process that will help you through. They're done in Microsoft projects, so you'll need to get some Microsoft project software. Um, and the beautiful thing about these plans is that if you change one line item, like say if a trade is late and they don't turn up on the day and they come the next day, you only have to change one line item and it adjusts every single line thereafter, okay? So it's all there done for you. I value those at $500 each. There's a value there of $2,000 for those construction project plans. You also get my checklist and template CD. As I said, I've got 144 checklists in the templates in the system. You don't have to use the whole 144, you just use whichever ones you want. What you'll find is that as you start becoming more experienced with renovating, the less and less you have to do, okay? So I'm starting you off in a very safe position, and as you go through each project and your confidence gets in, you know, involves and you become more experienced, you'll find that you have to rely less and less on some of these things. Certainly a lot of them I still use to these day in my projects, though. Also, I'm, as I said, I develop checklists and templates um, whenever I get the urge to do so, and so they actually get emailed out as well. Okay, what is also included in your package is that as a two-hour site tour. Now, the beautiful thing with you being in Sydney is that it's a very easy drive. A lot of my interstate students fly in from interstate to see my site projects, so what I do is I actually take you through my current project, which is in Hill Street, Leichhardt, and basically it is one thing. What you learn in the workshop is one thing, and it's great, but then to then come out on site and see, be walked through on a room-by-room -room basis of where I've added value, what I've done in each room, why I've done it, what money I've spent, to see that again is another level of learning. So this is actually the icing on the cake for many of my graduates in that they just love the site tour. And they get brought through the properties before and also on completion as well to see the transformation. Okay, I've also developed, for me, I've, you know, Renovating for profit takes great pride in making sure our six students are very successful. I don't want anybody coming through my program or enrolling who's not going to be committed to this because at the end of the day, it is my reputation, okay? I want to make sure I have a very high percentage of students. And as far as I know, my students are tracking it. I've had the highest performance statistics in the industry for the amount of people who actually come through my program and actually walk out and actually do something with it at the very end. I'm tracking at the highest stats. So... What, um, I take great pride in that and we do a lot, you know, whatever we can. So obviously I can give the knowledge component, I can give you all the tools. Pretty much I thought, okay, what else can I do for them? And so what I did is um, about a year ago I developed a national trade group and this is basically where we've gone in and negotiated all the discounts for you with some major suppliers. Now I'll flick through this. My major supplier in this particular trade group is Harvey Norman Commercial. Is that a commercial? Has anybody ever heard of Harvey Norman Commercial? It's where the big developers buy. It's locked doors to the public. You have to be a trade to basically go into this showroom. You have to make an appointment to go in. You can't just waddle in from the street. Now these are the place that Mary and Mervac, you know, big developers buy from. Just to give you an idea, those big developers typically buy at cost price plus 3% profit margin. So those suppliers will make just 3% profit margin on cost price. I've negotiated a rate so that my students now pay cost price plus 5% profit margin, okay? So you're almost buying at the same prices as a big developer who's buying 200 of the same bath. If you look at it on the flip side, it ranges from retail price less 20 to... It's a range of 20 to 40%. Not every brand you can get... Um, 
at that price. So some of the brands and the discount levels are depending on the actual brand, but typically it's cost price plus 5%. So you now have the ability to get those products at very, very cheap price. Um, you get this trade card which is this black card here. You'll also get a, a big folder full of trade supplier letters, which have all the letters. So what you do is you take this trade card into the supplier. So, you know, Amber, like you can see the brands here, like Amber, for example. You take it in with the supplier letter. You present that at the counter. The counter they show your card, and you show the letter, and you'll, that discount will be applied. So it's very, very easy to actually order your materials and get these discounts. Um, just This is one of the catalogues that you get as part of Harvey Norman Commercial weighs a ton. I hate carting this around the, con the country because it weighs about 10 kilos by itself. But every student of mine that comes through the program, I give this to you on disc at the workshop and then when you actually go into for your first appointment at Harvey Norman Commercial, you get this in store. So this is an 800 page catalogue that has everything from taps, tiles, cooktops, ovens, range woods, dishwashers, air conditioners, everything you can possibly get. And what is in there is what you can get the trade discounts on now, okay? So they really are a one-stop shop that, you know, again, can make your life very easy. You can either go to 50 suppliers and get your stuff or you can go to one and get a very competitive price. So do you like that? It's very good. We have builders in our system basically come through just for the discounts on the trade alone. One of my students actually um, sent a really nice email through to us saying, I paid for the cost of your investment, the cost of the workshop, twice over just from the savings I got from the trade group alone. So, you know, that's what you have to look at. All right. Um, also, as I said, renovating for profit are very committed to um, making sure you are successful. I'm smart enough to realise that your first property project is going to be your hardest. We're under no false illusions there. It's like starting a new job. You know, the first three months is the hardest. Then, you know, at the six-month mark, you start to feel comfortable. Once you've done it for a year, you're doing it like with your eyes closed. Same with renovating, okay? It's, not, it's unrealistic to think that you're going to go through smooth sailing without any issues. You'll still have some little issues, but there's a big difference between, you know, and I guess that's making mistakes. There's a big difference between making mistakes that will sink you and mistakes that you'll learn from, okay? So we're aiming to basically not make any mistakes at all that are going to sink you. So what you do is walking out from your workshop, you get 12 months support. In fact, anybody that enrolls today, your support starts from this point forward, okay? And you have a further 12 months from the time you actually do your workshop. So what it is, we provide support via telephone, via email, via Skype. Um, heck, you're in Sydney, you can even come into our office and talk to my staff. Now, if my staff, my graduate support team, can't answer the question for you, it comes through to me. So I'm one of the rare speakers who actually don't mind talking to my graduates, okay? I don't like to put myself up on a pedestal like that. What I'm concerned is, is making sure that you have profitable projects, okay? So there's a lot of support there. Um, I, again, I believe I'm doing this the best in the industry with the team that I've got in place. I pay, you know, very good wages to have them there. Um, I've really committed a lot of resources to making sure that you're successful. Also, moving out from the workshop, um, I have a uh, Simon, my camera guy, sorry, Simon put you in the spot, um, works in our office full time. And so Simon actually follows me on my projects during the day because quite often I'll be on site and I'll go, I don't know, should tell my students that. So, you know, my workshops are not a construction workshop. That's reality. You can go to Bunnings and get that stuff for free, right? So there's lots of stuff that you can learn even just from a construction point of view. So I send out weekly videos to all my graduate. They're normally like a five-minute or a ten-minute video, and I just talk about all random stuff. This week's video was about plantation shutters, the do's and don'ts of plantation shutters, how to get your plantation shutters cheaper, what are the key things you need to look for, you know, what are the correct installation methods. The one before that, last week before that, was about tiles, the do's and don'ts of tiling, you know, or sometimes I'll teach something about just something real random stuff about renovating. So my graduates absolutely love these, you know, these, these weekly videos. Um, it, just, it just continues to take their learning to a new level. All right, so I just want to recap, lastly, what you're getting in the package. So as I said, you get the ticket to the five, no, five day, three day boot camp, you get the home study kit, you get the DVD library, the three property due diligence systems, the financial feasibility, the legal contracts, which are 22,000. I mean, for me, that's a no-brainer. <laughs> it really is. Uh, the full construction project plans, the two-hour site tour, you get the trade discounts. I can't even put a value on that. How much is that worth? I have no idea. Um, you get the 12 months post-workshop support, so that's where my team will phone you once a month. If you don't want to be phoned, you tell us. Just phone me every three months. Don't call me at all. I'll call you. So that's all part of our process. 
Um, you also get the checklist and the template CD. So if you actually look at the value of the package on an individual basis, it's actually 33,000 worth of um, products, tools, systems and products. That's reality. As I said, I make no secret about it. The ticket to my workshop is $5,495. Now, yes, it is a big substantial investment for a lot of people, but I would ask that you look at this. The reality is if you don't know what you're doing in property investment, renovating or developing, you will blow that on the wrong electrician. One stuff up with one tradie, you will blow that. And that's really the cost that you have to look at, okay? Because you can either try and wing this on your own and make mistakes and loss potentially many hundreds of thousand dollars, or you can pay that sort of that pay that fee for that education and go into this with full confidence that you're going to do it right. Now, a lot of um, husbands and wives do my workshop, a lot of sisters and brothers, business partners. Um, basically, you know, two heads are obviously better than one as well. And so a lot of, I call that my partner deal. So if you do want to bring a second person, then there is a reduced rate for the partner. So the partner rate is 3495 the reason why it's um, $2,000 cheaper is that typically the second person doesn't need a second set of everything. So, for example, if you're husband and wife, you don't need two home study kits, you don't need two feasibilities. Um, if you do need a second set of materials, we can arrange that as well for a small fee. Okay, I want to make it easy for you. I realise that some of you may want to do the workshop. In fact, if this workshop was for free, who would want to do it? Okay, everybody. Um, <laughs> I would honestly, I would love to be able to give you the workshop for free. I would absolutely love. I've really tried to keep this as affordable as I can with the costs that are involved. I want to, I want to reward you for taking action because really, the difference between me and I guess you at this point in time is that I just took action. Okay, I made that decision to throw in my job and do this full time. Some of you may not want to do throw in your full time job. Some of you may love your job. Okay, some of my students have come through just want to supplement their income. Okay, so there's lots of options there, but I want to reward those people that do take action today. All right, so I'm going to be at the back of the room to answer any questions and to take registrations for the workshop in six weeks' time. Did you have some fun today? Did you learn some stuff? Okay, awesome. All right, we'll hope to, uh, hope to see you at the back and um, any questions and I'll see you there. Thanks, guys. Enjoy the rest of your weekend.